Good morning, and welcome to the Wisconsin County Association Virtual Legislative Exchange. My name is Lance Plimmel, Chair of the Wisconsin County's Association Board of Directors. It's a pleasure to see so many members of the county government family are joining us here this morning. You know, it's been almost a full year since we entered into this world of virtual participation, and my hope is that we can begin to meet in person again in the not too distant future. Despite the challenges we face during this pandemic, county elected officials and staff have continued to provide the highest level of service to our communities. It is through your dedication and participation in events like this that we have the opportunity to share ideas and enhance those efforts. So on behalf of the entire WCA Board of Directors and the WCA staff, we welcome you to this event. This meeting is officially called to order. I would ask at this time that you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a very full agenda this morning, and so, without further delay, we will start the program. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this portion of our program. I am very honored today to be with our governor, Governor Tony Evers of the state of Wisconsin. And I invite you into what normally is our county government living room where we have coffee and, and idle chat. Uh, this time we're going to maybe have coffee, but we're certainly gonna have some chat with the leader of our state. Uh, governor Evers, welcome to county government. And we're so happy you could join us in this new virtual setting. Well, thanks so much, Mark. It's always a pleasure to be with, uh, with the counties and the folks that work in the counties. And I, I know people have heard me say this and I'll say it again. It's, a, it's, it's really important for me to uh, partner with, with uh, folks in our uh, local county governments. Uh, you, you guys do the hard work. Uh, it is important for my administration to uh, continue to recognize that. So thank, thanks for inviting me and uh, um, let's, let's talk. All right, we're gonna have some conversation about some of that hard work here in a little bit, but I, I know some people are wondering, it's been two years since you first took office. And one of the things people wonder is, uh, and I'll phrase it this way, because you and I have talked about this, besides the sweet melody and harmonious call of the swans on the lake, what is it you've enjoyed most about being governor? Well, you know, and it's it's been, made more complex because of the pandemic. There's no question about it, but I, I still have been just uh, thrilled with uh, just talking to people and getting, getting, their, getting their information. I, I was just, just got off the phone with somebody that lives up in Manitowish Waters and uh, uh, I know him pretty well. And uh, he was telling me about uh, uh, how, how best to do X and Y and Z. And so he, he was full of uh, advice for me. And I, I, and I don't mind that either, but just, just interacting with the people of Wisconsin, helping them you know, dream for the future and what they want this, this state to look like. And uh, that is, uh, that's really important. I, obviously the pandemic has made them more complex. We do it a lot like this, which is not nearly as uh, uh, enjoyable. I'm a I'm a hugger. I like to shake hands and all the things that we can't do right now, but um, we're getting there. But that's, that's, I would say that's the most important thing uh, is getting out, meeting people, doing it this way if we have to. Is, is there a portion of the, of, the, of the position of governor that you, you didn't anticipate at all and, and really have been, it's been a bit of a challenge or um, a surprise to you? Well, no, I mean, if, if, if you're relaying to whether uh, it's been fun working with the Republicans or not, uh, it, it's been okay. I mean, that, that part's been okay. But as far as um, kind of the personal thing, I, I'll use this as an example. And I really like to ice skate. And um, I like to ice skate because it is something I like to do alone. And, uh, and, you know, if you do it at the right time of day, there are not many people in the ice and you can kind of zone out and just skate. 
Well, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> uh, I've tried it a couple times and it's not zoning out when you're, you're skating with uh, three or four um, undercover police people. <laughs> it just, it kind of takes away from the, uh, from the gestalt of ice skating. And so I, I've essentially had to give that up. And I, and I hate to even admit that out loud because somebody will get back to the, the people that are protecting Kathy and I and uh, they'll be offended. But uh, the fact of the matter is that it changes your life. It does. I mean, there's no question about that. The personal part of your life. Are the are the people that that would skate with you? Are they like the the, the uh, law enforcement folks? Are they good yeah. skaters? Can they keep up with you? Oh, they can, they can keep up with me fine. But it, <laughs> it see, I, I'm just I'm so used to just like I said, I I used to skate, uh, uh, get my skates, go down about six o'clock at night and skate uh, skate uh, before. After the after school crowd has gone away and before the, the kids come back and play hockey, I'll have a, wherever I'm going, I've got the ice to myself and it just isn't going to happen. So it's, it's something, something that I, I have to uh, just accept and move on. Well, I have to confess, I think uh, we've overlooked an opportunity here. I, I played hockey for many, many years. And so I've skated a lot in my life and I think I'm, blowing an opportunity as a lobbyist to have a little personal time with the governor that I know <laughs> that right. I known that I'd have been out on Lake Men Men Mendota and skating with you. <laughs> well, I, if you don't do it on Mendota, you better bring a shovel along. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the pandemic has really, uh, it has challenged us at all levels of government and all parts of society. Uh, certainly it has impacted uh, how you lead the state of Wisconsin as our chief executive, but it, it, in what ways has that been the case? Well, it it uh, you know obviously we're going to we had to uh, morph into a more uh, uh, Zoom oriented or technology or oriented communications, but you know we we got to walk and chew gum at the same time while we're we continue to do the things we need to do uh, on one side as far as you know making sure the roads are fixed making sure that uh, ma making sure that the you know state government is is operating we are also responding to a global pandemic at, at this at the same time and that that has been you know balancing that has been uh, a really important thing i think we've done a pretty good job at that balancing that we still uh you know we, we still have been getting uh, our roads fixed for the most part, thanks to the counties and the municipalities and frankly, our Department of Transportation. But um, uh, we also, you know, the, the pandemic has taken, uh, um, taken you know, top, top billing because it, it, it has to, it, it, you know, we're talking about saving lives and uh, uh, that, that is obviously taken a real important part of our, our jobs to focus on that, but we, 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 can't af we can't afford to let other things go too. So it's, uh, it's been a balancing act, but I, I, think, uh, uh, I, I think we've been able to do the good work that we've needed to do. You know, speaking, speaking of roads and, and the work that the state has done, uh, we've interacted with, with your department secretaries on many, many occasions, and they're very good about reaching out. Um, I speak with Karen Timberlake from you know, on a frequent basis, and, uh, and, and I think your agencies are, are really well run, uh, but I can't help but uh, I highlight one of them. I, the Department of Transportation, it, it may be one of the best run state agencies in all of our nation. I mean, uh, the, the secretary is just so incredibly skilled and talented and represents you and the administration exceedingly well. And I, I mean, you can tell, I mean, our transportation infrastructure, it's, it's in good hands. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Craig, does, Craig Thompson does a good job. Uh, it'd be nice to get him finally uh, approved by the legislature, by the Senate. Uh, but we, you know, it, we, it is what, we, what it is. Uh, apparently, uh, we're going to be moving along with people that haven't been uh, haven't been approved and by the Senate and they'll still that that doesn't stop them for any of them from doing a good job so while while it's frustrating I know personally and professionally for them uh, that hasn't stopped them from doing the great professional job that uh, they should do and um, it, you know it, road work is not not 
really sexy stuff that people like to talk about, but it is so important for our state to you know, have a winter like this and the, the uh, destruction that'll happen to our roadbeds uh, is really is really critical to make sure we continue to continue to fix continue, you know it's it's around getting kids to school it's around getting uh, uh, you know the products to market you name it and uh, it, it's and it's important for local governments and it's important for the state so yeah Craig's done a good job he's uh, he's just a wonderful person to work with. So we've uh, just recently you introduced the, the the major piece of policy that occurs every two years, the state budget. Yeah. Uh, lots of numbers, all appropriations, all the expenditures and revenues, and and a, a good number of, of policy related items. Uh, you laid out uh, the the budget in your speech, and the documents have been very comprehensive. But in, in your words, what are some of your priorities in, yeah. in this state budget? What is it yeah. you'd like to really focus on? And Mark, thanks for, for asking that because I, I just want, and most of your members understand how all this stuff works. And uh, I feel confident that uh, uh, we are gonna get some things accomplished. I mean, uh, broadband is exceedingly important, not just to, you know, certainly our rural economy and our rural residents, but also our, uh, in our urban areas, not only is it um, around uh, ac access, but it's around affordability. We 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 put we put 150 million dollars towards expansion expansion statewide, but we also put 40 million dollars for making sure it's affordable. That's huge. I mean, anytime we think of where we uh, where we need to go in the state. I don't care who I'm talking to, the most conservative Republican or most liberal Democrat, broadband is part of it. We've, we made a good start last time, but we also, um, uh, we were, 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 I think, doubling or tripling what we did last time. Maybe it's even more, but we have a chance to do that. We have to do that. I know we'll get, I know that uh, it, it is an important priority for others. Expanding Badger Care is really important. You know, think about the mental health issues that uh, this pandemic has laid bare across our state, expanding Badger Care. And uh, a lot of folks are across the state of Wisconsin, 90,000 of them will get health care uh, health care coverage uh, by, by doing that. We're paying money into the federal government every year. And that is a, and we aren't getting what we should get back because of uh, our inability to expand Badger Care. I know we can get this done. The other thing are two really important ones and it impacts every, every county in the state. It's bouncing back economically from this, uh, uh, of this pandemic. And it's not just bouncing back, it's bouncing back better. And that's why we did two things. One is we were putting um, with WEDC, uh, $200 million for small businesses. And that is critical Main Street across with this, this state, whether it's rural Main Street or, or suburban or urban, uh, those businesses have struggled the most. There's no question about it. We need to give them help to, to hire back and to keep people hired. Also making sure that uh, uh, we're, 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 fo we're focusing on um, a venture fund, uh, making sure startups, which have really dried up during the pandemic, I don't care where it is across the state of Wisconsin, uh, we need more venture capital and that $100 million for that is, is also really important. The other, um, and, and some money for local, um, regional, local and regional workforce development uh, activities. And the last thing I think people feel strongly about, and I do too, is uh, education whether it's two thirds funding for our, our public schools or whether it's uh, uh, additional money for our University of Wisconsin system. Those are all critically important for us to bounce back. Uh, I had a chance this weekend to um, read the, uh, some, some of our neighboring states and what they're gonna be focusing on as it, relates to, um, as it relates to bouncing back and bouncing back better. All of them are going to be focusing on the issues that I've talked about, especially higher education. A lot of a lot of people understand how important higher education is. 
uh, not just you know for preparing people for the future, but what it does to local economies, it's really critical. So those are the areas that uh, I, I'm very excited about and, uh, and, and very, uh, very excited about having you be part of the final budget. Uh, part of the budget, in part of the budget, you're recommending that there also be some flexibility with a, a local option half cent sales tax. I really think this idea kind of started with Milwaukee County that's had a, uh, some, some definitely some challenges. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the, what, what are your, what's your thinking behind the sales tax proposal? Yeah, and it, that's a great question. But yes, it, last biennium, it was um, primarily Milwaukee County that uh, was was taking a look at this. And I've heard from lots of folks across the state, county and, and municipalities saying, you know, we we can do this. We're, we're, we're falling behind what other states are doing, what other municipalities are doing in other states and uh, other counties and, and other 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 government agencies and uh it's not that we're looking to raise money but uh, raise taxes on people but sales tax is something that uh, can come in various ways and uh it's and it's not a deal it's not a great deal it's 0.5 percent sales tax a lot of that will be paid for by people out of state of course some of it will be in state but our our local municipalities, our local counties need to have that need to have that revenue. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting this through this time. Uh, and uh, the reason it's in there again, frankly, is because I've heard from so many others outside of the Milwaukee area. It's important for it's important for the people in Marathon County, La Crosse County, and counties up north. It's it's really it, the time has come. And so I'm I'm hopeful that. Uh, that uh, you and your organization can spend some time educating uh, legislators about it because I think we can get it done with some help. Now, some of the other areas, frankly, in addition to that, that, uh, that I think will directly impact uh, uh, counties and county government, broadband expansion, I, I'll say that again, uh, it opens up growth and uh, innovation and education, really important and of course our we talked about roads before. I'm very happy to put in a 4% uh, over the biennium for uh, for road work and 5% around the issue of uh, uh, transit. All those are uh, all those are important things. And one one thing that people may have missed in the talk about all the different things, but I for you know it's it's getting around the state that uh, I, I learn these things, but. Preventing flooding is an increasingly uh, thorny issue for local government and, and county governments. And so we're doing whatever we can to uh, um, put some more money in there to you know, increase, uh, increase the ability to mitigate that before it be, you know, after it started. Um, and also uh, 15, so that's about $10 million in, in that uh, flood control arena but also $15 million in a pilot program to support flood, proof, flood proofing and, uh, and prevention for local roads and infrastructure. That's huge. I mean, I, I can tell you the counties I've gone to over the last couple of years that have, you know, really had to invest time and money and, and we, we, we have to have a much more comprehensive view of how this, uh, how flooding is really uh, impacting our infrastructure in our state. So those are just some of the things that I think uh, people in the counties uh, might be interested in, in knowing about. And uh, uh, so I feel good about that. I also feel good about the fact that we've asked for more money for a county, UW extension agents. I think uh, um, it's important to make sure that our, our farmers have the best information possible and those people are, are uh, indispensable, I think. And so we're going to be able to uh, provide some resources to improve that services too. Well, uh, <clears throat> later in the program, we will have uh, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson, now president of the University of Wisconsin System on. Uh, and I've known, you know, I've known each other quite some time and I've known Tommy Thompson a long time. Um, you, two, you and uh, Governor Thompson seem like two people that could have a true Wisconsin refreshment and solve a lot of problems together. <laughs> uh, so how, how is your relationship with, with the university president, Tom Johnson? He's great. I mean, he, he and I uh, 
talk regularly. We also, uh, uh, we've I, just uh, a couple of days ago in Oshkosh uh, uh, with um, one of our healthcare providers and, and the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and Tommy Thompson and myself opened up a new uh, COVID or a new uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination uh, uh, center in at UW Oshkosh. So it's kind of like the Wisconsin idea on steroids where, where they're working with uh, our, our state government and our health services along with the UW system and, uh, and, and a healthcare provider to provide the best services possible. Today I was in uh, uh, Marinette, uh, Tommy couldn't make it, but uh, he had representatives there that, uh, you know, we were doing something at UW uh, Marinette with Prevea Health at getting, getting people uh, the shots in rural Wisconsin in Northeast Wisconsin. So yeah, it's, it's, we, we're doing good work together. And uh, um, as I said before, the, we, we really care about the University of Wisconsin system. Not, you know, yes, it is about preparing people for the future and the future jobs, but it is also, um, the, they bring, they bring um, a really important uh, vigor and vitality to wherever there is a University of Wisconsin Center uh, or to your campus or or system or any any part of the U UW system. It's 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 an important part of our legacy and it's a real important part of our future. In the when the budget was introduced, uh, the legislature had uh, a response to that. Uh, I think it's fair to say that they didn't jump up and hug a lot of the areas of the budget. Uh, some they express some displeasure with, but what, what parts of the budget do you think ha hold the greatest likelihood of a shared vision? Uh, oh, which items are we most likely to agree with? Yeah, that's what I, I want to encourage your, your members to realize is that so much of the, whatever reactions you, you see are, and you, you know this, you've been around the, the block as many of your members have. Of course, are, uh, it, if it's a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature or vice versa, there's going to be that kind of initial pushback. But at the end of the day, um, Republicans want good health care just like we do, just like I do. Republicans want great schools just like I do. They, they want to make sure that um, we recover from the pandemic and, uh, and having $200 million set aside for our small businesses across the state of Wisconsin. They are, you know, they may disagree with the number or something like that, but of course they want that. Of course they, they know as well as I do that um, whether it's uh, uh, in Northern Wisconsin or in one of our urban areas, uh, venture capital is really important. We've, we've been talking about this for years. We have an opportunity to, uh, to take care of that. So there are some big broadband, broadband. They've been talking about it. We've been talking about it. Now, I think we have proposals on the table that absolutely will be part of the final budget. May they look a little different? I'm sure they will, but I, I think uh, Republicans want the same things we do. We wanna recover from this pandemic and we wanna recover better than we went in. We, we have to take this opportunity, not just to get back to where we were, but really look at the future. And, 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 the, uh, and broadband's a perfect example of that. If we continue to kind of you know, slowly get, get it going, uh, we, will, we will fall behind other states. We have to have a major effort around that. We have the opportunity to do that. We have the resources to do that. I think there'll be, there, there will be bipartisan support on a whole number of things that, that we have proposed. And I'm not looking for the credit. I'm just looking for us to move forward. We have been talking with Governor Tony Evers, governor of the great state of Wisconsin. Governor, any final parting thoughts you'd like to share with the county family? Well, certainly. One, one last thing I'll mention, and it, it, I don't think anybody's commented on it, but we, we do have a lot of uh, issues around racial uh, inequities and inclusive and being an inclusive society in our state. And we've talked about it a lot this summer during the different things that have happened in different states, including our own. And uh, we're, we're really going to be focusing on that internally as, as uh, 
as a, as a state government. We, uh, we think it's important for us to uh, become uh, more diverse and, uh, and more equitable in the way we approach our world. And, uh, and so we're gonna be spending a lot of our personal in, in state time, in state government time, making sure that we're, uh, we're a Wisconsin for all and that uh, equity does matter. And we're gonna take a really close look at our, 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 our own practices and our own hiring practices and how we, uh, how we make sure that the people that work for the state of Wisconsin um, uh, are, are appropriately prepared for uh, a different society as we move forward. So that, that, that's kind of an internal thing, but uh, it's, it's, it's also something I think as a, as a large employer in the state, the largest that uh, uh, we're, we're gonna be focusing on. I think it's an important thing. We see others do it across the state in the private sector. It's time for us to get on board. Any uh, final thoughts for the county family folks? Well, again, uh, I thank you for all your good work and uh, uh, county government is absolutely critical to the success and future of our, of our state. As I've said, to start out with, I'll say it to close up. Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting is done by county governments and municipal governments, and uh, we wanna be a partner. And uh, we wanna be a partner in a proactive way. And, and I think this budget uh, uh, has been helpful. Certainly I've always appreciated the work of the County's Association uh, in being uh, representative of, you know, a wide diverse group of counties uh, from the smallest to the largest, from urban to rural. Uh, County Association always does a good job representing everybody. And so, I thank you, Mark, and your staff, but uh, I, I especially thank the folks in county government. One last thing I can tell you. I was up in, I was up in Marinette today, and I had a chance. We were opening this center for, for vaccines, and I, I was given the opportunity, and I probably talked too long, but the, the, the woman that is the public health uh, person from, uh, from that county, just like all of them across the state, you think about those people, dealing with it, you know, the health pandemic, and it, is a, and it is a political issue too. And some of the things that some of them have had to go to, um, it just makes me proud to be a Wisconsinite, to recognize people like them that are county employees, but they're just doing a hell of a job, making sure that they're trying to keep people safe and, uh, and healthy. And, um, uh, like I said, you guys are doing the hard work. I really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Tony Evers of the great state of Wisconsin. Governor, I want to thank you for personally being always very accessible to county government and your staff has done a tremendous job. We have very frequent uh, communication. You, you've been very open to our ideas and uh, we look forward to working with you on uh, passing a, a state budget beneficial to all of Wisconsin. Governor yeah. Evers, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark, appreciate it. Pharmacy benefits. It's a necessity of any health plan, but employers have a fundamental problem of spending too much on their plans. And as decision makers, you're focused on providing exceptional plans for your employer groups. You don't want to comb through contracts, negotiate variations based on group size, or tell a small employer they will have to pay more than a larger company for the same benefits. And that's where National Cooperative Rx comes in. We are a member-owned, not-for-profit cooperative that coordinates pharmacy benefits for hundreds of self-funded employer groups throughout the United States. Through strength in numbers, we have the purchasing power to offer one pharmacy benefit contract regardless of the employer group size. Each member has the flexibility to set up their plan design in a way that best meets their needs. Yet all members have access to the same deep discounts and personalized attention. Our experienced team helps manage costs through plan design recommendations, formulary oversight, and pharmaceutical education. Because we're member owned and member governed, our members are at the heart of every business decision we make. Let us show you the value of National Cooperative Rx. Hello, I'm Matt Chase, 
CEO and Executive Director of the National Association of Counties. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the Wisconsin Counties Association's Legislative Policy Exchange. NACO and Wisconsin Counties have an incredibly strong partnership, and we, we are so thankful for the collaboration and our shared mission of serving the great public servants within county government. I've been asked to provide a brief federal policy update today with a focus on the outlook for the policy priorities and issues facing America's counties. While we were only a few weeks into a new presidential administration and a new Congress, it has already been a chaotic, furious start to the new year. With an unprecedented storming of the U.S. Capitol, a semi-virtual inauguration of a U.S. president, and a Capitol complex that remains surrounded by an iron curtain of steel and barbed wire like a prisoner of war zone. And of course, the nation, even the globe, remains amidst a deadly mutating COVID-19 virus in this global pandemic. A national emergency that has killed more than 400,000 Americans, made tens of millions sick, crushed countless businesses, left millions unemployed, and has immeasurable other impacts. Within this hectic environment, both the White House and Congress have been busy with important early organizational and policy decisions. In the U.S. Senate, the two party leaders reached a new power sharing arrangement with the chamber split 50-50, the first time since 2001, with the vice president in the deciding vote. In this case, giving the Democrats and new Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer the slimmest of governing control. Across the Hill in the U.S. House, Speaker Pelosi also has an incredibly slim majority, down about 10 seats from last session, leaving her with only a four vote margin cushion to reach the magic 218 majority vote threshold. As we've witnessed with each of the new White Houses during the past 25 years, presidential executive orders and federal rulemaking are taking more and more of our time and attention as federal legislating becomes harder and harder. Like the strategies of President Obama and Trump, President Biden has issued a blitz of new executive orders, ranging from COVID-19 mitigation and vaccination strategies to immigration, to climate and the environment, to buy American and economic relief. Our NACO staff and our 10 policy committees are working each day to influence and provide practical real world input to the new administration on each of these new orders and other pending rules that impact county government. In fact, we just released a new comprehensive guide to the new key federal rules and executive orders that impact our member counties. For the National Association of Counties, similar to the Wisconsin Counties Association, our job, our sole focus, is to make sure that America County, America's county officials have a seat at the table, in our case, with federal policymakers. As you'll hear throughout my remarks, again and again, NACO's mission is simple, to strengthen America's county governments. While we are focusing today on federal aid and policies for COVID response and mitigation, NACO offers a full range of services for you as county officials. From tracking national and state policy trends, like state-imposed property tax caps and other emerging state preemptions, to supporting peer networks and focused on problem solving, such as our Stepping Up campaign, tackling the intersection of mental health and jails, to our national broadband campaign, with the Tested app, to our new online High Performance Leadership Academy, just to name a few. And I might argue that our civic education partnership with iCivics, founded by former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, this just might be our most important work right now. So check out our county's work, interactive online game, along with our K-12 school classroom lessons and our new kids activity book. Again, just as WCA is a tireless, effective advocate at the state level, NACO is your champion inside the halls of Congress and with the White House, federal agencies, and even with the U.S. Supreme Court. Our commitment is to serve as a nonpartisan, solutions-oriented force with our federal, state, tribal, and local elected counterparts. To be clear, we are not a special interest group, but an essential intergovernmental partner. Our job is to advance the priorities of county government, not from a partisan political viewpoint, but from the practical standpoint that counties are an essential, yet often misunderstood level of government. And we must be at the table. Thankfully, we currently have over 1,400 county officials 
serving on 10 policy committees in our urban and rural caucuses who dedicate their time and expertise to shape and advocate NACO's federal policy agenda. And we welcome and encourage more active participation from Wisconsin's counties. In recent years, NACO has achieved many important policy wins for counties at the federal level. And in early 2020, we were making even more progress on important issues prior to the pandemic. This included the Medicaid inmate exclusion policy that shifts massive unfunded healthcare costs for your jail inmates from the federal treasury to your county budgets and your local taxpayers. We secured important changes to the FCC's broadband mapping data, leveraging NACO's tested app. And we were where we crowdsourced and challenged the inaccuracies of current federal broadband data, both with speeds and access. And we're pursuing new county resources for infrastructure that's so essential to our nation's economic competitiveness and our local quality of life. From our roads and bridges to our airports and public transportation to water infrastructure and increasingly housing and housing affordability. I'd also like to thank U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin, a proud former county official, for her leadership in our joint pursuit of stronger federal rec recognition and support for our county veteran service offices. And as I mentioned earlier, we're spending countless hours on these unfunded and underfunded federal regulations and mandates. It's a full-time job that requires intense focus and substantial staff resources. So thank you to those Wisconsin counties who are members of NACO. We value your active engagement and your financial support, which is really needed to sustain our advocacy efforts. Now in my remaining time, I'll focus on the recent and current COVID-19 response efforts at the federal level. Since March 2020, Congress and the previous administration worked together to pass five federal aid packages. These plans evolved from targeted public health resources to broader and broader economic security and safety needs of all Americans, with an emphasis on our most vulnerable populations and businesses. Now, throughout the federal discussions, NACO is focused on telling the county story, making sure our federal policymakers understand the unique frontline responsibilities of America's counties. While each county may have unique services within a state, let alone nationally, all counties are key players in our nation's COVID-19 pandemic response. From owning nearly 1,000 public hospitals and clinics to operating or governing more than 1,900 local public health agencies to running emergency operations centers and even supporting the last of our first responders with our coroners and medical examiners. For NACO, we believe the only way to move forward, to unlock the full economic potential, and to protect the well being of the nation is to overcome the current global public health emergency. And as we've communicated to Capitol Hill in both administrations, and repeatedly, county officials are serious, prudent stewards of public dollars. We are aware, even frightened by our mounting federal debt. Yet we also understand that we must overcome this devastating pandemic together now so we can make the smart investments needed to pursue a brighter, more resilient future for our residents in our communities. So our number one priority is to figure out how counties can help fight COVID-19, including the new mutating varieties, with a focus on improving the vaccination process, as well as continued testing and other virus mitigation strategies. As proven throughout the pandemic, counties are also effective partners at helping the countless small businesses, the unemployed workers, and our most vulnerable residents, all being crushed by the virus. NACO and our county leaders are not looking for an unlimited federal handout. But just as the federal government has appropriated billions, even trillions for individuals, major industries, small businesses, nonprofits, and many others, we are asking Congress and the administration to help ensure our counties have the resources and the flexibility to serve the immediate needs of our local communities. We also wanna make sure the nation, down to our local counties, are better prepared and more resilient for future pandemics and other major global and national shocks. As Henry Kissinger famously stated, the historic challenge for leaders is to ma manage the crisis while building the future. Unfortunately, in the most recent federal aid packages, 
The issue of new federal aid for state and local governments has remained a major sticking point. The new and latest battle is over President Biden's $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, which includes a proposed $350 billion for state and local governments. For NACO, we support the President's efforts to ensure state and local governments have the resources necessary to lead through this pandemic. While we are less fixated on the overall dollar amounts in the non-county provisions within the package, we are very focused on the specific potential funding levels for counties. This includes critical decisions in intergovernmental fights over state and local allocation formulas, eligibility criteria, and compliance guardrails. We want to secure a fair, reasonable formula for distributing any state and local government aid. A formula and allocation process that reflects the responsibilities and mandates for counties with respect to COVID and public health measures, as well as our broader roles and responsibilities as county governments. Throughout the congressional debates last year, we had to weigh in repeatedly and aggressively on various proposals. Proposals that too often gave states significant control and power or rewarded cities far more than counties. And other intergovernmental challenges that you probably live with every day within your own state house and even within your own county. As I wrap up, please be sure to visit NACO's COVID Resource Center on NACO.org and be sure to participate in our national conference calls and other committee events. We have in-depth, yet hopefully concise, reports on available federal resources, updates on the latest federal plans, county innovations and noteworthy practices, federal resources and others, including our tools for our social media campaign, We Are Counties. Help us educate our federal policymakers about the important and unique roles that America's counties play. You are all on the front lines providing essential leadership in public services. It's imperative that counties stay at the table with our federal and state partners. Whether on COVID relief, upcoming talks on infrastructure, disaster relief reforms, election reforms, issues tackling things like criminal justice reform and mental health, to our nation's broadband strategies. Now, let me thank you again for inviting me to speak. I look forward to continuing to work with you in the Wisconsin Counties Association as we build stronger counties for a stronger America. PMA is a full service financial advisory and investment management firm. So we have been in existence for 35 years and we were started by a CFO of a community college in Illinois, Dr. Robert English. He passed a large referendum for their community college and found that he didn't have good options in terms of investing those funds. So he came up with what was called the prudent man analysis, which was his own developed um, analysis for banks and the credit worthiness of financial institutions. Given that it was during the SNL crisis, this was really important. And that's how we were founded, really was with that analysis, and PMA actually stands for Prudent Man Analysis, which very few people know that. Uh, but starting from those beginnings and just growing from there to the point now where we work with 2,500 local governments in 11 different states doing financial advisory work, long-range planning, and investment management. What makes PMA stand out is our comprehensive approach to finding the, the right solution for counties in Wisconsin. So we bring to it the integration of, of people that are professionals in different areas, whether that's municipal credit analysis or investment management, long-range planning, or financial advisory services. We're able to hit on, I think, most of what a county government official is scratching their head about and, and trying to find a solution for. Good morning, and thank you for joining us at our legislative exchange. Uh, we're now at the portion of our event where the WCA government affairs team will provide our legislative update. And, and by legislative update, today we're really going to focus on the state budget, since that's the item um, that's really uh, taking up all the oxygen in Madison. 
So um, I'm Kyle Christensen. I'm the Director of Government Affairs with the Wisconsin Counties Association. And I'm uh, joined by our entire Government Affairs team today. That includes Sarah Diedrich Kadsdorf, Dan Barr, Marcy Rainbolt, and Chelsea Fiber. So again, today, what we're gonna do is give you a, a little bit of a budget update, relatively high level over the next 60 minutes or so. Uh, when we're completed with the presentation, we're happy to answer any questions uh, that may arise or any clarification uh, that you're seeking. Uh, so with that, I, I think we'll, we'll get started. I, I'm gonna uh, give a, a brief overview kind of on some of the budget numbers, and then we'll follow that with a more county specific breakdown of some of the large items uh, included in the budget. Again, this won't be comprehensive today, uh, but please remember that WCA and our government affairs team has provided a comprehensive budget summary that's available on our website at wicounties.org. So getting started, one of the first things I think anytime we talk about a budget, one of the first things that comes to mind is, well, how much money do we have? Um, and how much new money are we raising? This chart here shows the general fund tax changes that are included in the governor's proposed two-year spending plan. And, and the, the numbers I really want uh, to take note of here are the net change here um, in the bottom right corner of, of this chart. And what you can see is that the governor's pro pro proposed budget on net generates about an additional $500 million in each year of the budget. So that's about a billion dollars. Now, based on the reaction that we've already seen from the Republican controlled legislature, a number of these revenue enhancement measures or tax increases that the governor has proposed um, will largely be dead on arrival when, when the budget goes before the state's budget writing committee, the Joint Committee on Finance. So what that means is that even before the legislature really begins its work on the budget, they're gonna have about a billion dollar hold because they're not gonna do some of the revenue enhancement measures that the governor has proposed. In addition to that, when you, when you add the billion dollars that they're not going to do in tax increases with the roughly seven to $800 million that would be generated through Medicaid expansion, which is something the governor has also proposed, we're looking at about a $2 billion shortfall because neither of those items are going to, going to materialize. So I think that that should hopefully give us um, a good understanding of where this budget is starting. Essentially, they're gonna to have to cut about $2 billion out of what the governor proposed, given they're not likely to do Medicaid expansion and they're not likely to do some of the income tax cuts that the governor has proposed. Moving on from some of the general fund tax changes, um, you know, where does the money come from? And what you can see here is that the state's general purpose revenue, the state's general fund, which is comprised largely of income and sales taxes, and we'll talk about that next, um, but that represents almost half of the state budget. In addition to that, though, the other large chunk of money um, that, that the state uses to fund its two-year spending plan are federal dollars. And you can see here that the governor's budget proposes uh, about 30% of all spending is from the federal government. Now, I will note that there is a current stimulus bill uh, before Congress in Washington, D.C., that if passed would not only provide additional aid to local governments, counties included, but it would also include about $3.2 billion in additional funding to the state of Wisconsin directly. Assuming that that package passes in its entirety and at the amounts that it's being proposed, um, you would see that 30% Fed number um, grow significantly. So right now when the governor proposed his budget, he's not assuming any additional federal support or federal stimulus, but uh, as things are looking right now, it appears that some will be on the way. There will be cash transferred from Washington DC to Wisconsin. And ultimately that means that the state budget is likely to be more reliant on, on federal funding than what this chart shows. Uh, looking specifically at the general fund um, in our next slide here, what you can see is that uh, this is really an age old issue with Wisconsin's uh, tax code. And, and what I mean by that is we don't have a, by a very diverse tax base. If you look at where the state generates its money from taxes, it's really two sources. It's the individual income tax, which comprises almost 50% of, of all tax collections that the state takes in. And then it's the sales tax. Um, this is one of the reasons when, when we talk about Wisconsin being a, a high tax state, a lot of times we're referencing the income tax and Wisconsin has, uh, we're in the top 10 as it relates to the individual, individual income tax. And this chart shows you why. It's because we're not overly reliant on other revenue streams or sources. You can see the sales tax represents about a third uh, of the money the state collects. 
Uh, but our sales tax nationwide is well below average. So one of the things you'll see um, in the governor's budget that we're going to talk about um, is additional reliance on sales tax, especially at the local level. Uh, but again, this is nothing new, but I, I do think it highlights um, Wisconsin's very narrow uh, revenue stream uh, for funding state and local governments. Uh, the next slide here, we look at which programs um, really received a significant increase in this budget compared to the last budget. And of course, the, the, the number that sticks out here is the Department of, of Public Construction. What you can see is that in the governor's budget, uh, the governor is proposing about $1.6 billion in additional funding uh, for DPI, um, or in other words, K-12 education. That's where a lot of the new spending um, is going. You can see that represents about half of all new spending is going to DPI. Uh, next, you can see the Department of Health Services. You're looking at about a $463 million increase. That's largely driven by the state's Medicaid program. And then finally, maybe a surprise, because we don't usually see this um, in this area, is the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. And the reason that you're seeing a, a rather significant um, increase in investments in, in WEDIC is because a number is because the governor is funding a number of new um, COVID-related initiatives uh, for small business and other entities uh, affected by the pandemic through WEDIC. And that's why you're seeing the increase um, with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. But really, once again, I think the story here is about half of all the new spending in this budget is going to K-12 education. Uh, moving on to the, the next slide, you can see here where the budget actually allocates the funds. And you can see that the biggest allocation, about 50% of the entire state budget goes to local assistance. Um, and that's comprised largely of aids to local governments, including counties, and then K-12 education um, as well. Uh, the next biggest chunk is aids to individuals. This is largely the Medicaid program um, and, and other social support programs. Um, but again, the, the big piece here is local assistance. And, and this is relatively unique to Wisconsin in that what you have here um, is you have the state collecting the majority of all state and local tax revenues, they collect on themselves. But what they then do is they redistribute those dollars back to local units of government. And the reason for it is because we have a system here in Wisconsin where counties primarily are actually the, the level of government providing the service. So again, you have a little bit of a disconnect here where it's the state collecting a large sum of the money, but it's actually the local governments that are spending the money because that's where the services are provided. So uh, again, th this is um, not necessarily new, but it is different than a lot of other states where um, the revenue is raised by the government that spends it. That's not necessarily the case here in Wisconsin. So that's a, a little bit of an overview, just very kind of high level, big picture of, of what this budget um, ultimately, ultimately looks like and where some of the major uh, funding increases are. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn over to my colleague, Dan Barr, to drill down on more county specific items as it relates to the issue area of agriculture, environment, and land use. Dan, take it away. Thanks, Kyle. Hey, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. And so we'll take a look at some of the agriculture, environment, and land use issues um, to begin with. Um, and the first issue, which has been a big issue uh, for, for WCA and a lot of organizations, has, has been um, stewardship reauthorization. Um, two years ago, Governor Evers um, extended uh, the stewardship, the Warren Knowles, Dealer Nelson stewardship program for two years. Um, he wanted to have a blue ribbon uh, panel study the program. That did not quite come to fruition because of COVID and other reasons. And so the big push, I think, in this budget from advocates of the stewardship program has been for a 10-year extension, and, and the governor's proposal does just that, extends the program until fiscal year 31-32 uh, at $70 million per year. Um, the proposal provides $700 million in bonding authority for the program, and so a lot of environmental interests, a lot of counties who uh, participate in this program, very happy to see that happening. Um, there is opposition, particularly in the state Senate, among Senate Republicans, um, to this program continuing. They're con concerned about the level of bonding in the state budget. And so uh, we'll see where that, uh, where that ends up, where that all shakes out. We'll, we'll of course be working very hard to uh, support the 10 year reauthorization of the program. Um, another program um, which uh, we've been advocating for at WCA relates to uh, a tipping fee exemption for waste to energy facilities. Both, <clears throat> pardon me, Barron and La Crosse County both have what's known as a waste energy facility and how a waste energy facility works is it's a facility that first they, they take in all the tonnage of, of waste 
they sort through all the waste and they recycle what they can recycle. What they can't recycle, then they burn and they generate energy. For instance, the uh, waste energy facility in Barron County supports the uh, cheese factory that, that is across the street from it. The uh, waste energy facility in La Crosse County supports uh, the energy corporation that provides uh, energy and power to residents in the La Crosse County area. And so they save money on their uh, utility bills. And so that's a, a positive thing. And so um, essentially what this would do is it would, it would uh, um, exempt these facilities, a waste energy facility from 30% uh, of the tonnage they receive. And so there is an incentive for them to essentially um, recycle and then burn up to 70% of their tonnage. And then if they do that, then the 30% that has to go to the landfill is exempted from a tipping fee. Um, for these two facilities, only two facilities in the state of Wisconsin, both in Barron and La Crosse County. And so uh, our goal has been to exempt those for up to 30% of the tonnage they receive. Um, already the, uh, what's known as a MRF, uh, a material recovery facility, they already received this exemption. And so we just want to extend that um, to the waste energy facilities, the MRFs, um, they recycle and they don't um, burn waste. In this case, the, uh, the, the waste energy facility both recycles and then they burn what they can't recycle and then what they, they're not able to do either with goes back into the landfill. And so again, this is a positive development in terms of environment and land use issues. Um, county uh, conservation staffing and cost sharing grants, we've long advocated for the program, no doubt, um, but the governor's budget provides an increase of uh, just over $3.7 million in uh, funding to counties for conservation staff to support uh, land and water conservation services. Um, this was also uh, something that we had asked for with the speaker's task force on clean water. And um, unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, the bill did pass the Senate. There was um, an effort to increase the base funding from $8.96 million to just around $12.4 million in that clean water package that did not pass. But the governor's budget does do that and more. It actually increased the uh, base funding for the program from 8.6 million to uh, just under $12.7 million annually in both years of the 21-23 budget. So that would provide full funding for uh, staffing for conservation departments across the state. And then of course, uh, the Wisconsin Fund, um, replacement and repair of uh, private on-site wastewater treatment systems, otherwise known as POTS. Um, this uh, lifts the sunset of the program. This this is a program that assists low-income Wisconsinites with the repair and replacement of their um, private on-site wastewater treatment system, otherwise known as a septic tank. And so um, it's a great program in terms of finishing off the inventory of uh, pouts that have not been rehabbed and replaced to make sure that uh, zoning departments and, and code administrators are up to date and going through their inventory and, and, and ensuring that the, the water is clean. They're replacing the pouts. They're providing uh, updates across the state in terms of, of checking and making sure that these pouts, if they are in bad shape, they can release waste into the water system. And so we're trying to avoid that. There is still inventory left in terms of uh, replacing the pouts that need replacement. And so we have asked the governor and the governor has affirmed our, uh, our, our ask in terms of doing so. And so we think this is a good program could be positive in terms of uh, clean water issues that were brought up in the past year or two. And so with that, um, that that's sort of a, a short term look at some of the uh, environmental land use issues, although there are many, um, those are some of the big issues we've been tackling. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Marcy Rainbolt, who is gonna talk about county organization and personnel issues. Thank you, Dan. So there's a lot to, to cover in county organ personnel. And so first I wanna talk about the many changes to our elections that was included in the budget. Uh, so first, um, the governor in the budget said that the Wisconsin Elections Commission is going to now work with the Department of Transportation to begin automatic voter registration. So basically, uh, personal identifying information will automatically be transferred from the Department of Transportation to the Elections Commission. There will be an opportunity for folks to opt out of this transfer, but obviously if you don't take that opportunity, your information will be transferred from DOT to the Elections Commission for automatic voter registration. Uh, the second provision related to elections um, would allow municipal clerks the option to canvas absentee ballots on the day prior to the election and would also um, 
give the Elections Commission the opportunity to ensure that the elections are still being conducted safely and sec securely. We refer to this as Monday legislation. We've been working with the clerks uh, since the last session to try to pass legislation that would allow this opportunity. This was 2019 uh, Assembly Bill 636 or Senate Bill 574, if you'd like to review that legislation. Uh, there was many provisions in that bill um, that um, people would have, or municipalities would have to um, adhere to to actually take advantage of that opportunity, um, including how to secure the ballots, uh, how to provide public notification, all the other requirements um, that are included with absentee ballots. Um, but new in this um, included with the budget was that um, canvassing would only be allowed um, to um, happen during specific time of 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the day prior to the election. Uh, the third provision on elections included in the budget um, eliminates the restriction on how soon a person may complete an absentee ballot in person and provides that they must do so no later than 7 p.m. on Friday preceding the election. Uh, the fourth provision is modifying the scheduling of special elections to ensure they are scheduled with sufficient time to comply with federal requirements uh, for sending ballots to military and overseas voters. Um, fifth is authorizing the Wisconsin Election, Elections Commission to reimburse counties and municipalities for certain costs incurred with the administration of special primaries and special elections. This too was a uh, bill that was introduced in the 2019 legislative session, uh, Senate Bill 71. Um, it had overwhelming bipartisan support in both the Senate and the Assembly. Unfortunately, it just wasn't able to get through the legislative process. Um, so we're excited to see that it was um, included in this budget. Hopefully we'll be able to keep it in um, the budget. Um, we have a lot of information on past special elections where the costs that were incurred at the local level were just astronomical. So this is encouraging to see it included in the budget. And then last but not least, um, the budget includes modifying the election commission recount appropriation to allow local units of government and petitioners to be reimbur reimbursed in a timely manner. Um, next is broadband. So we all heard from the governor prior to the release of his budget that this was going to be the year of broadband. And he kept true to that promise in providing $200 million in investment for broadband. Uh, his main focus was increasing the funding for the broadband expansion grant program, which is housed at the Public Service Commission. So he provides $151.7 million in GPR over the biennium for the program. And then there's also $2 million annually from the state's universal service fund, and that's required statutorily to be provided. Um, a little bit about this program, in the 2019-21 budget, there was $48 million provided for broadband expansion grants. So clearly this is a significant increase in the program. Um, in 2020, there was 143 applicants for that $48 million, and they requested over $50 million in grants. 72 grants were ultimately um, awarded. And then since 2014, so the inception of the grant program, um, the PSC has awarded 210 grants. Um, further on broadband, um, the bill um, eliminates restrictions um, for certain municipalities that are defined as underserved or unserved so that they may um, invest directly in broadband infrastructure and provide this service to their residents. Um, these communities would then be able to apply directly for the broadband grants from the PSC. And then finally on broadband, um, I think really interestingly is a new program uh, created in the budget, which is the Broadband Line Extension Grant Program. Um, the budget provides 1.75 million in GPR in the first year of the biennium and three and a half million in the second year. Um, and basically what this program does is we've seen examples across Wisconsin, obviously mostly in rural areas where broadband infrastructure might just be right outside a resident's front door, but a service provider is not obligated to um, provide that line extension um, from the infrastructure to the residents, and it's also cost prohibitive. Um, so this program would provide up to $4,000 per request to connect that residence to that broadband, which is just out of reach. Um, moving on to UW Extension, we have seen um, for Extension that since 2014, 
Um, they have had a $5 million reduction and a loss of 30 county educators. Uh, so in the budget, the governor has included $2 million and 15 county-based agricultural positions for UW extension. So just um, under half of what um, has been lost will be returned if it stays in the budget throughout the process. Um, for our veterans, our County Veterans Service Office, um, we know that the grants that are provided from the state are just a drop in the bucket when it comes to their overall budget. Um, but it is still um, an important uh, grant for our County Veterans Service Officers. So currently a full-time CVSO with a population of 75,000 or more can receive an annual grant of $13,000. Um, those with the population between 45,000 and 75,000 uh, receive a, pop, um, a grant of 11,500. Um, the population between 20,000 and 45,000 grants are 10,000 and then less than 20,000 receive grants of 8,500. A part-time CBSO receives $500 annually. The governor in his budget did propose including a 5% increase to the grants for the CBSOs across Wisconsin. And then competitive bidding. So um, the uh, Wisconsin Counties Association has been working on increasing the competitive bidding threshold since long before I came to the association. Um, we have not seen a change in our competitive bidding threshold for local governments since the 90s. Um, we know that Iowa has a competitive bidding threshold of 100,000 and Minnesota um, also has a threshold of 100,000, yet Wisconsin has remained stagnant at 25,000. Um, we had um, several bills um, where we had um, tried to increase the threshold. We had a standalone legislation last session and then um, I think one or two bills last session where we had it um, included as an amendment to increase the threshold. Um, so the budget does include increasing the threshold for local governments from 25,000 to 50,000. So this is encouraging. We're hoping to also keep this included in the budget and hopefully see a modest increase in our threshold for local governments. And then as far as labor changes go, um, there was obviously several um, labor changes included in the governor's budget um, for labor practices, including um, repealing the prohibition of contracts between labor unions and employers um, who hire unionized workers. Um, it repeals the prohibitions on the following conditions related to um, attaining or continuing employment, including membership in a labor organization, um, paying dues to a labor organization, um, also um, reinstating the requirements for prevailing wage, both at the state and local level, establishing collective bargaining rights for state and local governments, um, also eliminating the annual recertification requirement for state and local government bargaining units. Um, this is obviously a repeal in Act 10 and also a um, repeal in the prevailing wage. This is clearly a non-starter for the Republican controlled Senate, the Republican controlled assembly. So obviously this will be one of the first things that is on the cutting room floor when it comes to the joint finance committee and their work on the budget. So these things will be removed from um, the budget um, when we see the joint finance committee commence their work on um, the governor's budget. And with that, I will turn this over to Sarah Diedrich Kasdorf. Good morning, everyone. Um, as is typically the case, uh, the proposed state budget does recommend significant changes in the budgets of the Department of Health Services, the Department of Children and Families, as well as the Division of Juvenile Corrections within the Department of Corrections. In terms of major systemic changes in this budget, we will see that primarily in two areas, uh, first in mental health, and then we see it again in youth justice. So while I'm gonna highlight a number of changes that are included in the budget, the majority of my time will be spent on mental health and youth justice. The first issue I'm going to talk about is Medicaid expansion. And as we saw in the previous state budget, the governor is once again recommending expansion of the state's Medicaid uh, program as allowed under provisions of the Federal Affordable Care Act. And under the proposed expansion, individuals with incomes between zero and 138% of the federal poverty level would qualify for coverage under the state's medical assistance program. 
That would add almost 91,000 individuals to the state's Medicaid rolls. In addition to the number of folks that would be served, uh, there are financial implications to Medicaid expansion as well for the state. Uh, Medicaid expansion would draw down approximately $1.3 billion in funding from the federal government, in addition to saving $634 million in state GPR. So if this proposal does not move forward, it would leave an almost $2 billion budget gap that would need to be filled with revenue from another source or with $2 billion worth of budget cuts. Now, Republicans have indicated once again that they will reject the governor's call for Medicaid expansion. Now, um, with the current public health pandemic that is facing our state, I don't think it's any surprise that the governor is recommending an increased investment in communicable control efforts uh, within his budget. The governor is recommending 28 new state positions, 23 of which would be assigned to the Department of Health Services Bureau of Communicable Diseases. Three of those positions are allocated to the creation of a communicable disease harm reduction strike team, and two of the positions are dedicated to data analytics and uh, predictive modeling. Um, the governor in his budget is also recommending $5 million in grant funding annually for local health departments to support communicable disease control and prevention activities. However, that funding amount, I would say, is far below the request that our local health departments made of the governor. This next item was really welcome news in the uh, budget. As you know, counties perform eligibility determinations for the food share and Medicaid programs through our 10 income maintenance consortia. And as we see in many program areas, the funding provided by the state is insufficient to cover our costs. Over the last several years, we have been working really hard to not fall behind in uh, funding our income maintenance programs. So that means that whenever there is an increase in workload or a change in caseload, we've been asking the state for an increase in funding. So the governor's budget does uh, recommend a funding increase in the income maintenance administration allocation to reflect a re-estimate of the caseload and updated program requirements. Uh, the the uh, increased funding amounts are $3.6 million in fiscal year 22 and almost $5.3 million in fiscal year 23. And that is a combination of state and federal funding, meaning that the state invests GPR and then we are able to draw down federal matching funds at about a 50-50 rate uh, for each, uh, each, uh, each dollar that the state invests in the program. And these numbers are very consistent with the DHS budget request. We did ask the governor to include the DHS budget request in their proposal, in his proposal. However, if Medicaid expansion does move forward in the budget, then we will be seeking additional revenue to cover that increased workload. Now the governor's budget does make significant investment in mental health services, and the governor announced those investments a number of days before he actually introduced his budget. And while we won't have time today to discuss the full package, we will hit on some of the highlights. So during uh, the last legislative session, we heard from a number of legislators who expressed an interest in improving the state's emergency detention system, of which counties are a significant player. In addition to that, the Attorney General heard loud and clear from the law enforcement community about their struggles with the emergency detention system that resulted not only in an emergency detention summit in October of 2019, but the creation of a coalition around modifications to the state's emergency detention system. One of the biggest frustrations with the current emergency detention system is a lack of placement options on a regional basis. And so to that end, the governor's budget provides $12.3 million in GPR in the second year of the budget to establish up to two regional crisis response centers. When the governor first uh, announced this recommendation, we didn't know exactly how the governor was defining regional crisis response centers. But as we looked into the budget documents, uh, it provides some indication as to what the governor would like to see these regional crisis response centers do. So as part of the budget, uh, uh, there is language that indicates that each is to offer a crisis urgent care and observation center a 15-bed crisis stabilization facility, 
and at least two inpatient psychiatric beds. Uh, there's also language suggesting that these centers would assume custody of emergency detention cases and also conduct medical clearances. In addition to the two crisis response centers, the governor's budget provides an additional $5 million in GPR in the second year of the budget to establish five crisis, crisis stabilization facilities across the state. They indicate that these are for adults seeking voluntary crisis treatment and that each facility could offer up to 16 crisis stabilization beds. Now, one of the frustrations that, that has been expressed by counties and law enforcement agencies is the time that it takes to locate a detention facility within, uh, with an available bed for individuals in a mental health crisis. Our county behavioral health agencies spend a lot of time calling facilities all over the state looking for an available bed, which can take hours and hours. In the meantime, we have our law enforcement officers sitting in the emergency department waiting to transport an individual in a mental health crisis to an appropriate detention facility. And while a current bed tracking system does exist in the state, it is not up to date and it only tracks hospital beds and is not available for counties to use. So the governor's budget allocates $100,000 in the first year of the budget and $50,000 in the second year of the budget to create a bed tracker system that not only tracks inpatient psychiatric beds, but it will also track crisis response and peer respite beds as well. The new tracker system would also be made available to all entities involved in identifying placement options, including counties. The governor's budget also boosts mental health crisis services by providing $1.2 million in GPR in each year to support the staffing needs of county crisis programs, as well as peer run respite centers for crisis services that they provide over the phone. Now, research has shown um, success in de-escalating mental health crises if a law enforcement officer is partnered up with a mental health professional. So at the request of law enforcement and supported by WCA as part of an emergency detention coalition we belong to, the governor's budget creates a $1.25 million uh, GPR grant program in each year of the budget that municipalities and counties can access to establish behavioral health and police collaboration programs to increase behavioral health professional involvement in crisis response situations. We also know that training law enforcement officials on how to de-escalate a mental health crisis situation is also a key component in determining whether an emergency detention can be avoided. Therefore, the governor's budget provides an additional $370,000 in GPR in each year for additional crisis intervention trainings for local law enforcement. Along those same lines, the governor's budget also provides $850,000 in GPR in each year to Milwaukee County to expand its county's mobile crisis team. And the budget also provides $100,000 annually to promote suicide prevention and awareness in veteran communities by conducting improved outreach to the traditionally underserved veteran populations. Now the next two slides contain recommendations that came from the governor's task force on caregiving. The governor's budget provides funding in both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 to expand services that are provided by our aging and disability resource centers. Uh, those expanded services include expanding caregiver support services to address the needs of caregivers of adults with disabilities between the ages of 18 and 59 and also requires ADRCs to designate a caregiver coordinator and create a marketing plan. Um, in addition, and this has really been a request of ADRCs and others in the aging community for a number of budgets now, is the expansion of dementia care, of the dementia care specialist program to all of the state's ADRCs. Unfortunately, what was not included in the budget is the proposal worked on by the Department of Health Services and our ADRCs related to ADRC reinvestment. So moving on now to county nursing homes, it is no secret that our state's nursing homes have really been struggling to make ends meet given the low rates that are provided through the state's medical assistance program. Our, our county nursing homes, one could argue, 
are disproportionately impacted by the low rates given the higher acuity levels of the individuals that we serve. The nursing home industry has really done a wonderful job over the last several years in documenting the state's caregiver uh, crisis and the need for increased funding to support our direct care workforce. So the governor's budget provides $78.3 million in fiscal year 22 and $163.7 million in fiscal year 23 to increase the rates paid to skilled nursing facilities throughout the state. Uh, that equates to an 11.5% increase in the first year of the budget and an 11.7% increase in the second year of the budget. And of those amounts that are allocated, uh, nursing facilities are required to uh, dedicate $40.4 million in the first year and $37.4 million in the second year to the direct care workforce. Now we're going to move on to uh, the budget, some items that are included in the budget of the Department of Children and Families. Now last budget, our top priority was increased funding to serve the increasing number of children in need of support by our county child welfare agencies. That resulted in a $25.5 million annual increase beginning in calendar year 20. Now unfortunately, those needs continue. And in addition to that, by September 29th of this year, Wisconsin needs to be in compliance with the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act. And as a result, the governor's budget increases funding for the Children and Family AIDS allocation by $10 million beginning in calendar year 22. Um, this funding will also be used to pay for increased foster care rates and kinship care rates that are included in the budget. Total funding amounts for the program will be about $106.4 million in fiscal year 22 and $111.8, almost $0.9 million in fiscal year 23. And to put this into perspective, counties received approximately $74 million annually in the children and family AIDS allocation prior to adoption of the last state budget. And the, the majority of that funding was federal funding. But over the last two budgets, if this increase remains, the state will have made a significant increase in county child welfare services, which we are very, very grateful for. So child support, um, this is an issue that we've had lots of discussions about during the last state budget and following the last state budget as well, given some uh, what happened in the Joint Committee on Finance, as well as some federal changes that took place shortly after the state budget was signed into law. But what the governor included in his budget related to child support is really a huge win for counties. Uh, very briefly, as you may recall, in the last state budget, the Joint Committee on Finance cut the governor's recommended funding increase for our county child support agencies by two thirds. Since that time, we also lost county child support revenue due to a new interpretation by the federal government related to the birth cost recovery program. All of this happened, of course, at a time when other states were making its significant investments in their child support programs, which caused Wisconsin to fall in the rankings, which then resulted in the loss of additional federal funding. So the $4 million GPR that is provided by the governor in each year of the budget reflects the request of the Wisconsin Child Support Association as well as WCA. The $4 million in GPR, GPR draws down just over $7.7 .7 million in federal matching funds for a total increase annually of $11.7 .7 million. What we really need to make sure we, we work hard at between now and the time the budget passes is, is, um, is really making the case for the need for these dollars and to once again, make sure that the uh, Joint Committee on Finance does not cut the governor's recommended funding amounts. Now the rest of my presentation all relates to the significant changes proposed by the governor to the youth justice system. The first change I'm gonna talk about reverses a decision that was made by the legislature in the mid 1990s. And in the mid 1990s, the state created what is known as the Serious Juvenile Offender Program. In short, the Serious Juvenile Offender Program allowed the state to hold youth up to the age of 23 or 25, depending upon the seriousness of the offense. And if a youth qualified for the Serious Juvenile Offender Program, 
the state took over fiscal responsibility for that youth, meaning if that youth was placed in Lincoln Hills, for example, the state had to pay the cost of Lincoln, that Lincoln Hills placement instead of the counties having to pay that cost. Um, in his budget, the governor eliminates the serious juvenile offender program and moves the fiscal responsibility for youth that would have qualified for that program back to the counties. The program is then uh, replaced with what the state is calling an extended juvenile jurisdiction blended sentencing model that would allow the court to extend juvenile disposition to the age of 23. Now, there are a lot of components to that particular uh, provision in the budget that we don't really have time to talk about today. So if you're interested in additional details, please get in contact with me. The governor in his budget does increase the youth aids appropriation by $5.7 million in fiscal year 22 and another $13.5 million in fiscal year 23 to cover county costs to serve the former SJO population. Now, in addition, the governor's budget eliminates uh, state-run type one facilities. As you may recall under current law, by July 1 of this year, the state is supposed to close Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, and those facilities are supposed to be replaced with county-operated secured residential care centers for children and youth, as well as uh, a, a couple of state uh, type one facilities that were to be designed to house serious juvenile offenders, as well as house uh, youth that have adult sentences. Uh, but the governor, again, in his budget, eliminates the state type one facilities, allows both the state and the counties to operate the secured residential care centers for children and youth, uh, removes the July 1, 2021 closure date for Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, and instead replaces that date with language that indicates that once all juveniles have been transferred to a suitable replacement facility, then Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake will close. With regard to detention facilities operated by counties, the governor's budget eliminates as an available disposition option, placement in a juvenile detention facility for more than 30 days. So what that really means is the closure and elimination of our county run 365 180 programs. So if we take a look at this in general, um, Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake are, are, is closing. So we know we will need some placement options for those youth. We know right now that only one youth is move, or one county is moving forward with constructing an SRCCCY. And so the question really becomes, what are we going to do with these youth that were formerly in Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake, or that would have been placed in our, um, in our SRCCCYs, or even in our County 365 180 programs. So I think where, where the state is going with this is they are really trying to move away from detention options or corrections options as placements for youth, and instead, the state really is moving toward more of a community-based treatment model, which based on research is probably the right direction in which to move. And I think most of our counties um, would probably agree with that philosophically. However, I think our counties have raised some concern about how all of these pieces fit together, whether or not we will have the infrastructure in place during the two years that this budget is, is in effect, in order to um, close Lincoln Hills, in order to close our 365 180 programs. Um, but in order to accomplish this, the goal that the state has set, the state budget does contain funding to provide youth justice workers first with some foundational training, similar to the foundational training that's provided to our county child welfare workers to get them to think differently um, in terms of what a youth's needs are and whether or not those needs should be provided in a facility or whether or not we really could uh, serve that youth in the community. The budget also contains funding for the provision of evidence-based services that are aimed at preventing the removal of children from their home. And this particular provision applies not only to the youth justice system, but to the child welfare system as well. The budget also includes a pilot program funded at $8.8 .8 million to serve moderate to high risk youth and under the program, counties will select an evidence-based treatment model 
and then partner with community clinical service providers who are trained in that particular treatment model. Yet we do know that some youth um, that are involved in the justice system will still need placement options outside of the SRCCCYs. And so the budget does create a grant program for out of home care providers to provide intensive services for justice involved youth who require treatment services in an out of home setting. The budget also includes funding for two types of residential service grants, as well as funding for a child placement agency to find treatment foster homes that will serve delinquent youth who require out of home care placement, but are unsuited for congregate care. Uh, some of these youth who would qualify for that provision, for example, might be youth who are involved in, in sex trafficking. So there are other justice uh, changes um, that are included in the budget as well that impact youth. And those include a prohibition on the use of restraints on anyone under the age of 18 when appearing in court, elimination of automatic original adult court jurisdiction for youth under the age of 18, modifications to the conditions under which a youth under the age of 18 may be waived into adult court, as well as an increase in the age of delinquency from 10 years of age to 12 years of age. Um, that change from uh, 12 down to 10 happened in the mid 90s. And it happened at the same time that we took 17 year olds and brought them uh, and placed 17 year olds into the youth justice system. And so moving on, as the governor did in the last state budget, uh, the governor recommends raising the age of adult court jurisdiction to the age of 18. Uh, to cover our county cost associated with serving 17 year olds that would be coming back to the youth justice system from the adult criminal justice system. The governor does create a new sum sufficient appropriation and provides $10 million GPR in each fiscal year to reimburse counties for the increased cost associated with raising the age. Again, what's really critical here is the term self or sum sufficient, meaning that once we um, once, if we blow through that $10 million as allocated in serving 17 year olds, the state will be required to find additional funding somewhere in the budget to continue to pay county costs. And finally, with regard to youth aids, in addition to the increased funding to cover uh, services to the serious juvenile offender uh, population, and again, we don't know whether or not that funding is going to be sufficient to cover our cost in serving that population or not, the budget also makes some modifications, some minor ones, to the smaller allocations that are included in the youth aids pot. And we're not gonna get into that detail here because that is really getting into the weeds. But what I will say about those modifications to the youth aids is that WCA and WICSA were involved with those changes and do support those changes. So at this time, I am going to turn it over back to Marcy Rainbow to discuss judicial and public safety issues. Thank you, Sarah. So most important, I think, for the association in this area and our top priority this session has been the inclusion of funds to support our PSAPs and the continuation of transitioning um, our 911 system from the current analog system to a digital system. So the budget did include funds um, to support our PSAPs and the need to increase or upgrade our equipment um, at the local level. So our PSAPs, of course, are 911 call centers. Um, and the budget did include $7.5 million starting in the second year of the biennium um, for grants to our PSAPs um, to be used to replace equipment, uh, for software expenses, and also for training. Um, of course, we at the association had been advocating for $15 million. So we're halfway there, and we're going to continue to push um, for $15 million. We do have some uh, tremendous advocates for us in the legislature, Senator Markline, Senator Felskowski, and Representative Loudenbeck, all members of the Joint Finance Committee. So we'll continue to work with them um, to push for our $15 million to support PSAP grants. Um, also included in the budget was supporting um, the ongoing work of the Department of Military Affairs and the creation of the Emergency Services IP Network, which is also known as the EZNet. That's that critical um, digital platform that we need to move off of the old analog system and onto that digital platform. Now there's some confusion right now as to whether or 
not the money included in the budget is going to be sufficient um, in continuing the work that DMA is doing. Uh, we know that the DMA this summer, um, or I'm sorry, this past fall had requested um, $18.5 million in the first year of the biennium to continue that work. Um, and the governor's budget only included $1.7 million. So right now we're seeking clarification to find out whether or not they are um, paying for the contract um, with the current funds that they have in the current biennium. Um, or if there's something else going on. So we're um, continuing to seek clarification on that. So stay tuned and we hope to have more information um, about that. Uh, the second year of the biennium for the EziNet, um, they provided $9.8 million. Um, again, the DMA had asked for 14 million um, for that to have ongoing maintenance and upkeep of the EziNet. So again, seeking more clarification there as well to see if there was a re-estimate or um, exactly what that um, figure means to the Department of Military Affairs. Um, also provided in the budget for um, this area was a $3 million grant program as requested um, for geographic information systems, so GIS. Um, starting in the second year of the biennium. This also is a critical piece in the advancement of our 911 system. Uh, GIS is a very important piece so that we can um, more accurately pinpoint the location um, of folks when they are using 911. So um, as for WISCOM, um, WISCOM is a land mobile radio system here in the state of Wisconsin. I think most um, who are involved um, with the WISCOM system know that it's coming to its end of life. Um, and the governor's budget does include six and a half million dollars in GPR for the design and implementation of a new statewide interoperable communication system. So um, six and a half million will be going towards that program. And then last but not least in this area is Treatment Alternatives and Diversion, or TAD. Uh, TAD is a very successful and popular program here in Wisconsin, and it currently operates in 41 counties. Um, and we've seen an influx in money over the last um, several budgets in this program. And again, the governor in this budget includes an additional $15 million in GPR in fiscal year 23 for the expansion of this TAD program. And that's it in the area of judicial and public safety. So again, I will turn it over to Dan Barr. Hello, and good to see you again. Thank you, Marcy, for that presentation. We're gonna move on to Transportation and Public Works um, for general transportation aids, popular county program. We have a 4% increase in the biennium, a 2% increase in each year of the biennium. Essentially our payments in county GTA payments on an annual basis will go from uh, just over $122 million to just over $127 million. So that's a round of roughly a $5 million increase. And then for a routine maintenance agreement uh, for the purchase of salt, the uh, governor in each year of the budget has included uh, just over 12 million in, in the first year and just over 13 million in fiscal year 23 uh, for uh, additional purchase of salt. We've had some rough winters lately. So he's trying to address that with uh, additional money for routine maintenance agreement with salt. Um, also for general transit aids, in each year of the biennium of the budget, there's a 2.5% increase um, for the different transit systems. There's four tiers and there's some detail provided below. I won't get into the details um, as we're on a bit of a time crunch, but um, you, if you have questions, you can certainly call me and the slide kind of explains how each system is impacted. Um, for the local road improvement program, um, the governor's budget maintains current funding levels. Um, we did get an increase in the previous budget. This budget is flat. And then we'll go to the next slide for uh, prevailing wage requirements. The governor for state projects re uh, restores prevailing wage requirements uh, for projects using state dollars. I think Marcy had also talked about that. Um, also for bicycle and pedestrian facilities, the governor's budget restores the ability of local governments to use eminent domain authority for the installation of bike trails and bike paths. Um, also one program that we had, uh, had been developed in the previous budget was a local multimodal transportation program. There was $90 million allocated in the previous biennium. Um, we did have about one and a half billion dollars in projects. And so the governor has included $75 million for this program again, in ongoing transportation funding. Um, again, the, the structure will be similar to the 2019-21 program, this time with uh, only $75 million, but that should help address some of the overflow in uh, applications for the program. Very popular program on both sides of the aisle. And then we'll move on. Uh, that's a little update on transportation. We'll move on to my colleague, Kyle Christensen with uh, tax and finance. Kyle. 
All right, thank you, Dan. So last but not least is the area of taxation and finance. And just a couple of slides here. Um, <clears throat> maybe the, the most notable provision, perhaps in the entire budget for, for county government, um, is the governor's proposal to allow counties to increase their sales tax by 0.5% or half a cent with approval from voters um, at the ballot box or via referendum. Um, <clears throat> As we know, counties have been um, reliant, over-reliant on, on property taxes for a very long time. And, and we've urged the legislature and, and governors of both parties um, to provide local governments and, and counties specifically with, an addition, with additional tools uh, to fund um, increased demand for local services, as well as a, a variety of state mandates that the state places on uh, Wisconsin's 72 counties. So we're very pleased to see that the governor does include this local sales tax option for all 72 counties. In addition, any community over 30,000 in population uh, would also have uh, this option. Uh, we were very pleased to see that um, the reaction to this from the Milwaukee business community was overwhelmingly positive. That's due in no small part uh, to the uh, kind of upfront and, and long um, work that, that Milwaukee County in particular has done uh, with their business community. Uh, the statewide Chamber of Commerce, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce has indicated their opposition to this proposal, uh, but this is something that the counties Association will be actively engaged on. Um, do I think that this proposal is likely to pass in its current form? I, I think that's pretty unlikely. However, I, I, I do think there are um, changes or amendments that could be made to, to the governor's proposal related to additional um, county sales tax. Uh, that, that, could that could potentially gain the support of members of the legislature. Uh, the other thing to note here is that while this provision is currently in the state budget, uh, in the event it, it gains momentum, don't be surprised if it were to be removed from the budget and then done as a separate piece of legislation. Of course, the reason for that um, is that the Republican controlled legislature is, is really hesitant to include uh, much policy in the state budget given the governor's um, pretty broad uh, partial and line item veto authority. So um, in the event that, that there's legislative support for this, there may be an attempt to pull this out of the budget and run it as a separate bill. Uh, but again, this is something that, that we'll be working um, uh, very closely with members of the legislature and the Joint Committee on Finance on, and we're very appreciative that the governor um, included in this in his budget. Um, and it really allows taxpayers to decide um, ultimately how they wanna fund local services. In addition to the sales tax, then we have uh, the governor proposing an increase in share of revenue. Um, similar to the governor's uh, last state budget, the budget provides successive 2% increases in funding for the county municipal aid program shared revenue to take effect in both 2021 and in 2022. Uh, then there are, again, um, changes to the levy limit law, similar to what the governor proposed last budget. Uh, the governor is proposing a 2% uh, minimum growth factor for levy limit purposes. You recall when levy limits were first instituted back in 2005, there was always a, a floor percentage uh, that each community could increase their levy by. Um, since 2011, however, levy limits uh, have really been tied to the change in property values due to new construction, um, which for a, number of for a number of counties and communities is oftentimes less than 1%. Um, so the governor did propose this again in the last state budget. Uh, this was one of the first items removed by the finance committee. Uh, we are meeting with members of the legislature on the on this provision and feel that um, it, it's really a long overdue change to the state's levy limit law. And then finally, just a, a, a change as it relates to county debt issuance authority. Um, the budget does allow counties to issue debt to replace any lost revenue due to a disaster or public health emergency, either declared by the governor or the county board itself. This is something that we had asked for um, really early on in the pandemic, given we didn't know what impact the, the pandemic would have on local revenues. We were worried about cash, um, cash flow issues um, and cash shortfalls. So this would provide um, at least a short term option for counties in the event we're experiencing um, significant revenue loss due to any sort of disaster or the current public health emergency. So with that, I think that uh, really completes our um, initial review of, of the governor's state budget. Uh, the Legislative Fiscal Bureau is currently in the process of summarizing the document and more details will be available in the next three or four weeks. Again, I'd like to remind you that our comprehensive summary 
uh, completed by our legislative team is available on the WCA website at wicounties.org. And right now I think we're um, ready to move into a live Q&A where we're happy to answer any questions or any clarification you're seeking. Um, any member of our team is, is happy to do that. So um, let's jump to the Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, up to this point, you have been viewing previously recorded sessions, our legislative team, as well as our interaction with the governor and the National Association of Counties, Matt Chase. But at this time, uh, my colleagues will be coming on live as a, for a panel discussion in the Q&A. I do wanna thank our legislative team, uh, quite frankly, one of the most talented groups of people in the arena of public policy and politics, really anywhere. Uh, and my congratulations and admiration to Kyle and his team. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A in the chat. I would encourage people to utilize the Q&A chat, Q&A and chat um, icons down below on your screen. A uh, couple of comments. One, uh, very good point, Sue. Uh, try to explain acronyms when you use them. We will do that in the future. Uh, Kyle, let's make a note. When we use all these letters and references, let's make sure we explain what it is we're referring to. Here's a question I think for you, Kyle. Given that the legislature has already made it clear that they do not agree with large portions of the governor's budget, do you expect the legislature to rewrite portions of the budget? If so, when can we expect their proposals to be made public? Yeah, uh, Mark, that's, that's a great question. I, I think um, really uh, right after the governor uh, introduced his budget a couple of weeks ago, um, you, you heard from legislative leadership and members of the finance committee that um, they were essentially going to start from scratch. And, and remember, that was the same reaction that we heard um, just two years ago when the governor introduced his budget. And, and, and really what that means, and, and this gets to be a, a little inside baseball, is that when the governor takes up the budget, and, and or when the legislature takes up the budget, and they're going to do it like they always have um, by state agency, um, what they're going to do is they're going to start not from what the governor proposed, but rather they're going to start from what the current funding level is. So, so think of it this way. If you have a program where the governor um, proposed increasing it by $10, the legislature is not going to essentially start from saying this program has a $10 increase. Rather, the legislature is going to start saying, look, this program was funded at you know, X number of dollars in the last budget. So now what do we want to do? And what the Fiscal Bureau will do is they're going to lay out options and they're going to say, well, you can cut this program, you can increase funding for this program, you can change it. Um, but one of the options or alternatives that the Fiscal Bureau will always lay out is what the governor proposed. So again, um, it's kind of semantics when the, when the legislature says they're going to rewrite the budget. Um, it's not like they're going to come forward with, with a you know, 3,000 page document and say, here's our budget. Rather, what they're going to do is they're going to start from current funding levels, go through the budget agency by agency or program by program, and then make changes uh, that way. So um, are there going to be a significant changes to the governor's budget? Of course, um, but we're going to see those happen kind of incrementally by agency, as opposed to the legislature introducing an entirely new document. Sarah, I think this one's for you. Um, earlier, you had mentioned something re uh, referred to veteran communities. What is the definition of veteran communities? Sure, thanks for that question. And I will uh, need to take a little closer look into the language included in the budget with regard to that. Um, I do not, uh, this, we pulled this language with regard to veterans communities from the budget in brief. And oftentimes that that language in, indicates what the governor's intent is as opposed to what the actual statutory language is. And so I honestly can't say whether or not veterans communities is the language that's included in the statute at this time and it, whether or not it has been defined. I believe that question came from Mike Fergal. I would be more than happy to take a look in the actual language of the budget to determine whether or not uh, that's the actual language used and whether or not that's been defined. Kyle, we've got a couple of tax questions here. Uh, let me just run through several of them and then you can answer them. Regarding the sales tax, will a local referendum be required? Uh, I guess I'll answer that. Yes, uh, the legislation requires that a local referendum be passed in order for the additional half cent sales tax to be imposed. Uh, in addition, Kyle, here's a question for you. 
please clarify if the 2%, the 2% levy limit uh, dollar amount or percentage is above and beyond net new construction or is the 2% the floor? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, what we're what the governor is proposing is really going back to um, 2005 when levy limits were first created. And when they were first created, um, what it, there was always a floor percentage so that in the event your net new construction was less than um, that floor, you could, you could go to that amount. So well, under the governor's proposal, the floor would be 2%. So if your net new construction were, let's say 1%, you could then increase your taxes by up to 2% because that's the levy limit. Now, in the event you had net new construction that exceeded 2%, your levy limit would then be based on the net new construction. So let's, let's assume you had new construction of 3%, your levy limit would be 3%, not the 2%. So 2% or net new construction, whichever is greater. Whichever is greater, correct. Uh, the, on the five on the half percent sales tax increase proposal, the question is what conditions could be placed on it that would make it more likely to be supported? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question and, and I'd encourage you to um, join us again tomorrow morning because we did speak with uh, legislative leadership in our in our roundtable segment about this this very item. Um, but when we talk about some of the conditions or changes that that might have to be made to gain legislative approval, I think we're largely talking about property tax relief. Um, if you recall, um, last legislative session, there was a standalone bill introduced um, at the request of Milwaukee County. And that bill would have provided the county the option of an additional half percent sales tax. Again, only limited to Milwaukee County. But a provision in that bill would have required that a certain percentage of the new revenue generated by the sales tax would be required to be devoted to tax relief. So essentially, we're going to collect more money in sales tax, but a portion of that new money has to go to reducing property taxes. I, I think um, something like that um, will likely be necessary if, if this proposal were to advance. What are WCA's top priorities to keep in the budget? Or what priorities are you hearing have staying power with the GOP legislature? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And, and I'll note that um, we're now just beginning um, conversations with members of the Finance Committee and legislative leadership about the governor's budget. We did have meetings prior to the governor's um, budget introduction with all members of the state's um, Joint Committee on Finance and kind of indicated our priorities. We're, we're doing follow-up meetings now with those members um, based on the governor's budget. So when we talk about uh, you know, our priorities, I think they're, they're very similar to, to what the priorities were prior to the governor's budget introduction. Um, those include, you know, funding for Next Generation 911. That's something we've been uh, focused on really going back to the early 2000s even. Um, the additional transportation um, allocations and, and funding in this budget is something we'll be prioritizing, as well as a number of the mental health initiatives that, that the governor proposed. And, and of course, the, the half percent um, local option sales tax are, are just a few of the items um, that I know that we'll be prioritizing. What's the likelihood of, of any or, or all of those items staying in the budget? I think it's a little early to tell. Uh, I know we're meeting with uh, Speaker Voss um, uh, just tomorrow and, and I believe next week with um, Senate Majority Leader Lemahieu. So I think we'll have a little bit better idea, but I'm not sure our priorities ha have really changed um, from the governor's budget. But um, a lot of things in here we want, we want to stay, for example, the, the additional aids and the um, children and family aids program. Um, a lot of good things that, that we'll be pushing for um, in our follow-up meetings in the coming weeks. Another question, how will our state budget be impacted by the COVID relief uh, uh, rescue plan working its way through Congress? Will the major influx of federal cash be seen as an offset or bonus to our regular state budget needs? And has the legislature discussed this matter? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a really great, great question. And unfortunately, I don't think we have a, a great answer for you. Um, you know, has the legislature talked about this? Not really, not, not a lot. And, and if you remember when, when the governor introduced his budget, um, he, he wasn't making any assumptions about um, an influx of, of federal funding coming to the state of Wisconsin. So uh, again, not only does the, the current package that, that will be in the United States Senate include additional aids to local governments and counties, but it also provides additional funding to the state to the tune of a little over $3 billion. 
So I, I think there are um, real decisions that are going to have to be made if that package ultimately passes. I, I think we're optimistic it will, um, but where will those dollars go or how will, it, how will they be spent? I think it's a little early to tell other than I know that legislative leadership will be very hesitant to spend those dollars on ongoing expenses. Um, if you remember back um, uh, really in the, in the late 2000s with um, Governor Doyle and, and when we had the um, Obama stimulus package, um, a lot of that funding went to K-12 education, which of course is an, is an ongoing spending item. I, I think there'll be resistance to do that given these are one-time funds. So I, I think the most logical place for these dollars to go would be infrastructure. Um, but again, I don't think that there's been a lot of conversation yet uh, amongst members of the legislature just because the package um, isn't final yet. I'd like to remind everyone that every Monday morning at 11 o'clock, we have a county leadership Zoom call. You can call in or connect via computer. And we talk about all of these kinds of things, everything in the state political arena, as well as the federal arena. And there's an update on the COVID relief package every week. And it allow, it, we also permit everyone to ask questions or make comments. So I'd encourage everyone to tune into the Monday morning, 11 o'clock county leadership calls. Kyle, here's another question. If counties need to provide youth offender punishment or rehab funding, does that take precedence over other program funding? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I think this is one of those items too, um, where we probably, um, we know a lot less um, than, than we hope to know at this point about some of the youth justice initiatives that the governor proposed in, in his budget. And what I mean by that is that essentially the governor is calling for, for an overhaul of youth justice, um, but we don't yet have an analysis from the Legislative Fiscal Bureau on that. You know, Sarah mentioned um, some of the programs um, that the governor's proposed. Um, you know, a particular note is the return of 17 year olds to the juvenile justice system. You know, that's a program that the governor's proposing funding with a sum sufficient appropriation. So what that means is whatever the program costs, whatever expenses county, counties have to um, address the, the needs of 17 year olds, those would, would be reimbursed. So in the event a provision like that stayed and it was a sum sufficient appropriation, then um, we shouldn't have to divert funding um, you know, from other areas to deal with 17 year old juveniles. Now I'll note there's, there's other items in the budget um, like requiring um, counties to um, be responsible for serious juvenile offenders, which are a group, of seven, or a group of offenders that currently are a state responsibility. There's additional funding for counties in youth aid for that program, but we don't know right now if, if that funding is sufficient or not. In the event it wasn't sufficient, um, then potentially we'd have to shift resources. So it, it's a great question. I, I think it's a little too early to tell what we'll really need to see the Legislative Fiscal Bureau's summary. But of course, if, if there's any area, especially as it relates to, to youth justice that is underfunded, we will be asking uh, the legislature to fully fund those programs. I remind my colleagues, we've got uh, about three or four minutes left and several questions yet. Uh, are the much needed nursing home increases likely to stay in the budget? Yeah, good, good question. Um, you recall that in the last budget, there was additional funding for, for nursing homes that was adopted. Um, there will be additional funding for nursing homes adopted in this budget, whether or not it's, it's to the amount um, proposed by the governor. Um, again, I don't know the answer to that, um, but there, there is an appetite on, on the part of the legislature to increase funding for, for nursing homes. Does the budget include provisions or programs to address the opioid crisis in Wisconsin? Yeah, there, there are a number of opioid-related um, items um, in the governor's budget. Um, I, I will note specifically um, that there is a substantial increase that Marcy mentioned in the Treatment Alternatives and Diversion Program, um, but there's other opioid-related items, and, and I'd, I'd um, encourage you to take a look at our, our comprehensive budget summary. What is happening with the problem of properly funding our transportation needs? Is it a gas tax, or are there other options being proposed? Yeah, so it, you remember in the last budget, um, there were um, uh, really sizable um, uh, investments in infrastructure and some revenue uppers. Um, the governor's budget does not include any new uh, revenues for transportation. So I, I think it's unlikely that this budget is going to include major um, revenue uppers uh, when it goes before the legislature. How likely is the $2 million increase for UW extension likely to, likely to stay in the budget? 
Yeah, if, if you remember again in the, in the last budget, there there was a, a push to include additional funding for extension um, that ultimately didn't didn't materialize. Uh, but this is something that I know is a is a priority um, for UW System President Thompson, which I think um, uh, provides us some optimism that that per, the provision could stay in some form in, in the final budget. Regarding debt issuance to for state or county disaster issuance. How does this differ from current law allowing for reimbursement of non-reimbursed costs over levy cap? Does current law reference state declared disaster only? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. My understanding, and I can follow up with um, Mark Abel's Allison on this, is that the, the current law kind of levy limit um, exemption only applies with a state declared uh, emergency. So that'd be something declared by the governor. This debt issuance um, provision applies both to declarations from the governor and declarations made at the local level by the county board. Mark, did your microphone go up? Um, here's a comment and then a question. In discussing broadband expansion, everyone seems to have forgotten that Governor Walker turned down $23 million in federal funds for that purpose. Now, don't we need a program to hardwire every residence just as was done with electricity in the 1930s? Yeah, somewhat... I... Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, and I, and I won't um, I won't pretend to be a broadband expert here, um, but but I will note that there are um, a number of conversations surrounding broadband in the state, especially especially as it relates to low orbit satellites. Where I, I know we had a conversation with Congressman Gallagher uh, just last week, where there's been some testing done on um, kind of the, the download and upload speeds that those provide to some rural areas. So I, I, I'm not sure if, you know, hardwiring or, or bringing fiber to, to every residence is, is feasible, but I know there's an interest in kind of looking at what all the options are on the table. And, and again, here's another um, area where I'd, I'd encourage you to take a, a look at the report done by uh, our very own Dale Knapp at Forward Analytics, where he looked at the broadband um, kind of challenge in the state of Wisconsin, and then also looked at what some of the solutions are. And, and, and I think the takeaway is that there's probably not just one solution. It's kind of a, an all of the above um, to, to really ensure we have that much needed infrastructure. All right. If we talk fast, Kyle, we can get through these last four questions. <laughs> in the SRCCY or Juvenile Correctional Facilities, please define blending sentencing model for community-based treatment facilities and name one or two evidence-based models. Yeah, on that one, I will turn it over to our uh, resident expert, Sarah. Sure, I'm happy to talk a little bit about what the blended sentencing model looks like. What, what we're referencing there is really the, uh, the replacement for the serious juvenile offender program in those instances where uh, there is a belief that for the safety of the community, a youth will need to be held uh, longer than their 19th birthday. And so there is there is within our... Um, or budget analysis on the website, I go into this in much more detail, but really, really briefly here on it. Uh, when a youth is sentenced that they commit a crime that would, um, you know, that really would allow them to be waived uh, from adult or from juvenile court into adult court, at the time the judge can provide them with both a juvenile sentence and an adult sentence. However, that adult sentence is not an automatic and once the youth reaches um, somewhere between the youth's 19, 18th and 19th birthday, there needs to be another court hearing to make a determination as to whether or not the youth continues to be a danger to, to public safety. And if so, then that adult sentence would be implemented. If the court finds at that hearing, again, between the 18th and 19th birthday that that youth is no longer a, uh, a risk to society, then that adult sentence would not be implemented and the youth would be released following the end of their of their youth sentence. Again, there's a lot more to it and a lot more complication to the program, but I'll leave it at that, Ken. And if after you take a look at our budget uh, summary, if you have additional questions, please let me know. Kyle, if we have a county project to expand emergency communications at this time, will funding be available for that project? Or do we need to wait until the grant is available prior to proceeding? 
Yeah, great question. And I'll turn that over to my colleague, uh, Marcy Rainbolt, who's actually a member of the 911 subcommittee, uh, which has been tasked with, with developing the rules uh, for the grant program uh, that'll ultimately be issued for, for counties. So Marcy? Yeah, thank you so much um, for the question. Um, uh, hopefully, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Marcy. Um, so I would say that, you know, it depends on where you are with your project. You know, if you're at the point where you're at end of life with your current um, equipment, obviously you're going to have to move forward. It's obviously going to be up to you and your emergency communications folks on where you are with that. Um, but um, I know pretty much for 100% certainty that the grant um, will likely not be retroactive. So if you are at the end of life and you need to spend that money now, um, unfortunately the grant won't be used retroactively. Um, so I would say that you're gonna have to make that decision based on where you are um, currently. Um, but um, it is our number one priority right now at the association to push for a grant program for our PSAPs, um, but the money won't be in that budget until the second year of the biennium. So that won't be until um, July 1 of 2022. So keep that in mind as well when you're looking at your budgets and where you are with your equipment and it's end of life as well. The beer tax has not changed since 1969. There are $21 million in revenue available if we move to the U.S. median. Any hope here, Kyle? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, th this is, uh, I, I don't think there's, there's hope for a lot of tax increases um, that have been proposed in this budget, um, but this is one that, that there's really no appetite in the legislature to, to tackle. Given that there are private sector consulting firms currently offering special engagement services to county and local governments regarding the federal rescue dollars, will the cost of such consulting be reimbursable through the allocation? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And, and at this point, um, I don't think we, we know the answer to that. Um, if you look at what the criteria is for eligible expenditures um, within the, the, the bill that the House of Representatives uh, passed la early last Saturday morning, um, the criteria is relatively broad, which is what we'd expect. So what that means is that it's going to be up to the Department of the Treasury to determine what's eligible and what's not. Um, so I until Treasury um, releases guidance, similar to what they did with the CARES Act when that passed uh, many months ago. Um, we don't know exactly what's going to be eligible, but we are, we are pushing to make sure that um, there's as much flexibility as, as we can possibly have on, on using these dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to a short message from our friends at Aegis Corporation, a Charles Taylor company, and then we will move to Dr. Joseph Stoltz. I strongly encourage you to stay tuned for Dr. Stoltz. I had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Stoltz in person in Washington, D.C., and while we have a legend uh, and one of our forefathers, George Washington, Dr. Stoltz really brings George Washington to life. It's an incredible presentation on leadership. Stay tuned because after Dr. Stoltz, we'll have a live Q&A when you are able to, well, I would say speak to George Washington through Dr. Stoltz. Let's uh, roll the Aegis clip and then we'll move on to the doctor. Hello, my name is Josh Dirksy from Aegis. We hope that you're enjoying this WCA virtual legislative exchange and we all look forward to being together in the future. We thank you for your service and leadership to your county, its employees, and the people it serves. Aegis has served as the General Administrator of the Wisconsin County Mutual Insurance Corporation and its sister company, Community Insurance Corporation, since our founding in 1992. As General Administrator, we provide all underwriting and policy administration, claims and litigation management, along with a strong focus on value-added member services, including comprehensive risk management and safety consultation and training. What makes Aegis different is our ability to customize our services to fit the specific and unique needs of our clients. We often say that we're big enough to face the toughest challenges and small enough to care. And it's true whether you're looking to control the costs of your workers' compensation program or need help in designing an effective risk management safety program, we're here to help. This year, Aegis is excited to join the Charles Taylor family of companies. Charles Taylor brings additional global resources in the area of claims technology and expertise, which adds to our already superior strength in the insurance management and claims administration service lines. At Aegis, we believe superior claims administration begins with highly experienced claims adjusters. 
our staff of claims experts average over 20 years of experience. Working as an extension of our clients' offices, we partner to improve claims outcomes through this expertise and couple it with innovative technology and data analytics. From county highway shops to your boardroom, Aegis's risk management consultants work in the trenches with our clients, working alongside them to show them the best way to control risk. Whether you're looking for sexual harassment training for all of your employees or need help with your annual safety program design, we stand ready to deliver programming specific to your county. If you have any questions or would like additional information, please visit us online at aegis-corporation.com. Thank you, and we look forward to helping you ensure your future. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Stoltz. I am the Director of Leadership Programs at George Washington's Mount Vernon, uh, where I am technically, uh, as you are watching, well, I'll probably be here too, technically while you're watching it, but I am definitely here right now. I am where I am. Uh, and we wish that we were able to welcome you all here in person, but one of the sort of exciting side benefits of um, you know, this whole strange COVID world uh, we live in is that we actually do have the opportunity more than we traditionally had uh, to sort of expand our programming and 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 be able to engage with uh, you know a, a widening amount of people. And so uh, you know we're, you're obviously watching this recorded right now, but I look forward to uh, meeting you all virtually here shortly. Um, so the program we're going to look at today is is <laughs> sort of especially George Washington as a strategic leader. And, and how he used, how he he altered his leadership and management styles uh, to sort of meet the moment, and and, and I think most importantly, uh, meet the objectives of the strategy uh, he was trying to achieve, depending on what that would be. And you'll you'll hopefully see what I mean more about that in a moment, um, because we're going to be sort of looking at one sort of specific case study, uh, and and that will kind of tease out from there. But I think you know there's there's a lot of things uh, I think to be learned from George Washington, uh, and I'm not just saying that because uh, he sort of pays my bills here at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, but I think Washington is an important leader in the sense of um, someone that was able to adapt to differing circumstances, someone that was able to find unconventional ways in some cases. Uh, to achieve success. And I think someone that was, was compared to many leader, many successful leaders that we find throughout uh, world history, um, I think Washington's, and in, in, in for me, a short list of people that was really able to identify large scale strategic goals and tailor his operations and tactics to meet those ends. And, and with me just using the terms uh, strategy, operation, and tactics, for some of you that might have queued you in, uh, that I might have some sort of military background. I never served myself, but prior to coming to Mount Vernon, I was a professor of military history at uh, the United States Military Academy at West Point. And Washington was always an interesting general officer to talk to our cadets about because cadets, bless their heart, uh, are young and young people can sometimes be kind of dumb uh, in in you know the best sort of ways, um, and it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? So so if 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 I am a professor of military history and I'm talking to uh, you know cadets that that joined the United States Army because they want to you know they want to go do the cool tactical stuff, right? That's what that's what. Uh, a lot of the commercials that the Pentagon uses to attract new recruits, right? It focuses on the cool tactical things, jumping out of airplanes, kicking in doors, making stuff blow up, frankly. Um, and that's the stuff that we train second lieutenants to go be proficient at being leaders of, because that that's the function they're going to have. We're not going to let, uh, you know, 21, 22-year-old second lieutenants be in charge of armies and conducting strategic level operations. But one of the things that the cadets were sometimes, you know, they, they, they know why, or they think they know why you're going to be talking about George Washington uh, to them. And yes, I was talking about George Washington before uh, uh, Mount Vernon paid me to. Um, but they're sometimes confused 
why you're talking about George Washington, because, well, as Cadet would correctly bring up, Washington was not often a winning battlefield general. If Washington was a college football coach, uh, he would have gone like three and nine, right? If, you, if you're just sort of scoring on battlefield victories on the field of play, Washington, probably three and nine. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure not all of you may have gone to the University of Wisconsin, uh, but I, I think we're all aware of what would happen to the head coach at uh, Wisconsin-Madison if they, that coach consistently went three and nine, right? We wouldn't necessarily consider that person a winning coach. Well, it technically wouldn't be a winning coach, but war and, and political aims, of course, aren't sports. We sometimes use sports metaphors uh, for, for war or, or for politics. Um, but they're not the same thing. And, and so one of the examples I would bring up to cadets and one that still works uh, quite well for me here in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC, is to compare George Washington to another uh, prominent Virginia, uh, gen Virginia born general, uh, and that's Robert E. Lee. Uh, someone who did win a lot of battles, uh, was a proficient tactical leader, uh, but, but some, oftentimes struggled on the strategic level and did not win the war he was fighting, thankfully. Whereas George Washington won his war, thankfully. Uh, and, and we'll sort of get into not only why that was, uh, which could, I could sort of in short say, because Washington wasn't trying to win battles, right? Because, because winning day-to-day -day tactical victories uh, is it, one is not necessarily the best way to achieve strategic ends. Uh, and as I would point out to my cadets that were about to be platoon leaders deploying to places like Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, frankly, depending on how you win the tactical engagement, it might actually go against your, 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 your larger strategic goals or what should be your larger strategic goals. Um, or what that second lieutenant should understand to be the strategic goals of the army and government uh, that he or she is working for. And that's where defining your strategic goals are important because if you don't do that uh, as a leader, you can't be surprised when your subordinates activities maybe aren't helping achieve the strategic ends. Because if you, the leader, haven't actually decided sort of what the strategic goals are you have in mind, you can't be surprised when that message isn't filtering down uh, and your subordinates aren't successful uh, at, at getting some wins. So what am I talking about with all this? Well, basically, the, with our programming, um, what we, we use Washington as, as a way to, to sort of understand the idea that to get success, you need good strategy, you need good leadership, and you need good management. And all of those things should constantly be directed back to uh, I, I would argue, especially to that, that per first part, the strategy, right? So if this was, uh, this is where it's going to get a little weird because I'm a three times humanities major. So me trying to make a math analogy is going to get a little risky. So bear with me. But right, if we're looking at this, this uh, sort of faux algebraic equation I have here on this slide that, you know, in, within this order of operations, if you will, the strategy part comes first for a reason. Um, and so what I would like to do over the course of this next uh, 45 minutes or so is, is, is one, look at sort of one macro scale example to sort of tease all of this out. And one that, you know, I think most of you are going to be readily familiar with ish, right? We all know that the United States uh, uh, successfully achieved its independence from Great Britain. Uh, in a conflict that occurred from 1775 to 1783. So using the American Revolution as an example of this and George Washington's time as commander in chief as an example of this is helpful because I don't have to get too history professor on you uh, to, to be able to tell some of the backstory. Uh, and I think that will help us get to some of the, the larger strategy uh, leadership and management points that are relevant to us today uh, as leaders and managers uh, and strategic thinkers within our organizations. So I mentioned uh, from sort of the uh, earlier on that you know if, if, if you don't have what we would call uh, in our programs here at Mount Vernon, a strategic vision, if you don't have a clearly articulated strategic vision, uh, you know, a, an outcome in mind, it is not surprising then 
that uh, your, your organization can kind of flail uh, and, is, and is sort of letting tactics drive strategy, right? Because all these, all these different activities you're undergoing are not actually pursuing any sort of coherent strategic outcome. Um, you're, you're just sort of responding to the situation as, as things sort of come at you. So the example of that I give is the American Revolution, um, which you know we 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 are all uh, aware of. Um, even if it's been some time since you've sat in you know high school or U.S. Uh, or college uh, survey course uh, or watched, uh, you know I don't know. Um, trying to think of what like halfway effective uh, and decent movies or TV shows about the American Revolution is, and there really aren't. And we can discuss that more during questions if you. If you have any, um, but basically, right? It, 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 this is one of those moments where it's helpful, as much as the American Revolution might be something that we are all aware of occurred and sort of know the basic histories of. There are certain aspects of it that I think, as a learning tool, are 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 more effective than others to sort of remember. And it's ones that, unfortunately, uh, in sort of, sort of the K through 12 and higher ed spaces, I think sometimes we're not the best at articulating. Um, and so, for example, with that, you know, think about how the American Revolution breaks out, right? It, it, is, it, it, it breaks out uh, you know, in April of 1775 uh, in, Mass in the outskirts of Boston, essentially what's now the Boston suburbs, um, because the British are trying to secure some weapons caches that they think um, some suspected colonial insurgents have. No one's goal at that point, right? Whether it's, whether it's the American insurgents or the British army, no one's goal at that point is to create the conflict that will become, come to be known as the American Revolutionary War. No one on either side is looking to kick off the conflict right then and there. Right? The British are launching an operation to try and avoid anything occurring, and the Americans are not fighting that day because they think that day gives them a particular advantage. Right? And, and think about just what we, 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 we tend to truncate the timeline of all of the events that, that sort of occur in what we call the American Revolution, right? That really go from like 1763, some folks would argue, all the way into uh, 1800 or shortly after, but you know, definitely into even if you just want to you know, bring it into uh, the Constitution, I mean, that's, that's 1787, the Constitutional Convention is occurring. And, and you know, the, the political situation in the North American colonies is deteriorating um, as early as 1763. In 1775, no one is looking to start a conflict right then, right? This is, a, this is a, a, an argument that has started out over taxes, um, that that tax argument has, for the course of almost a decade, um, you know, morphed into, you know, for some folks, not all, but for some folks, uh, a, a larger sort of uh, a question of political rights or sort of a constitutional question, if you will, um, which, of course, the British Constitution is a mess because it's not written down. And so you can, it, it, you think we have debates over what the interpretation of the Constitution is, at least we have a document we can be fighting about for the Brits. It, it's, it's much more of a mess uh, now and, and especially back uh, in the 18th century. Right, so, so no one in that conflict, that in, in, in those, those military engagements that is gonna occur around Boston, it's not actually clear what, what either side is sort of looking for right then and there. And so it's, it's really not surprising if we sort of, right, very few people, very few Americans at this point are uttering the words independence. It is not going to be until the summer of the next year, right? Until until July of 1776, which is actually be the re resolution uh, for independence and the declaration, and they're going to be able to get the votes uh, shortly before that. I mean, basically, this insurgency is kicking off, and for a full year, there's really sort of no clear strategic direction of what it is. Congress representing the American. Uh, insurrectionist once, right? And so it's not surprising that then George Washington, who's, who's appointed commander in chief of the Continental Army, is struggling to figure out what to do to help Congress succeed, right? Because Congress hasn't decided what it wants. Um, 
And so that's why I would argue to you, it's really, it, it, it's not surprising that you don't see a coherent American strategy emerging until the fall of 1776, because it's only until the fall of 1776 that the army and the military as an organization have had the chance to sort of digest what they're being asked to do. Um, and of course, as we all know, by 1776, what they're being asked in part to do uh, is help secure political and military independence from Great Britain, right? Declaration of Independence gets written, that's all of a sudden Washington's uh, primary concern. Now, how do you go about doing that, right? It's great to have a strategic vision. It has to be grounded in reality though, and, 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 and sort of what is realistic to be able uh, to be achieved. And on its face, the idea of American independence was frankly kind of doubtful, right? So the map you see on the screen is the British empire as it existed in 1776. Uh, of course, it'll get much bigger in the 19th century, but what's on the screen right now is plenty enough uh, for the Americans to handle. And, and, and a number of things that sort of bring out right away is that the most valuable British possessions are, you know, A, the British Isles, which the Americans don't have the resources to get, right? There's no big American Navy that can go across the Atlantic and, and try and, you know, threaten Devonshire or, 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 or you know, sail up the Thames, right? That's just, that can't happen. But realistically, the Americans don't have, at, at this point in, in the 1860s, the United States does not have the military capacity uh, to project force really anywhere uh, with, with one notable exception, which we'll talk about in a second, right? So, so the United States cannot get to valuable British possessions uh, like Jamaica. Uh, like San Lucia, like Barbados, like the Bahamas, right? The sugar, the British sugar islands. And I bring those up because as much as we might like to think uh, that people in London and, 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 and George III's ministry frankly cared at all about what happened to places like South Carolina or Massachusetts uh, or Virginia, in the grand scheme of the British empire, they kind of didn't. Because financially speaking, the American colonies didn't pay for themselves nearly as much as, you know, you didn't get nearly as good of an ROI uh, out of a place like North Carolina that you got out of a place like Jamaica. Sugar was more valuable. Uh, Virginia did a lot of tobacco, but the price of tobacco had kind of gone, demand for tobacco had kind of gone down by uh, the 18th century. And so the Americans are in sort of an awkward situation of they want to apply military right? Carl von Clausewitz, 19th century military theorist, war is politics by other means. The Americans want to apply political pressure on the British. They had tried doing that economically prior to the American Revolutionary War. That didn't work. That's why all of a sudden they're in a war trying to find a military solution to apply pressure. The issue is that when Washington and, and, and some of the members of the Continental Congress, right? Okay, so we've decided on independence. Great. Now what? How do we actually go about trying to apply pressure to the British? We can't actually get anywhere, says George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and others. We can't actually get anywhere that will, the British will care about. Now, you may notice that just north of uh, the, the 13 American colonies you're going to rebel uh, is a big red blob on your screen called Canada. And it is a place. It really exists. They're lovely. Poutine is fantastic. But George III was not about to let 13, and the British Parliament was not about to let the 13 rebelling North American colonies um, be, you know, be free in exchange for getting Canada back in the event the United States had actually managed to successfully capture Canada, which of course they didn't even, right? The United States tries an invasion of Canada uh, and it can't even pull that off. It doesn't have the ability to project that much force uh, north of its borders. And so how are, are, are Washington and others going to go about applying pressure to the British North American colonies to, to get the political outcome they're looking for? And, and the short kind of trick version of this, trick question version of this is they can't. 
there's no ability for the Americans to apply direct pressure to the British colonies or to British possessions. Can't do it. But Benjamin Franklin brings up in a discussion with George Washington when they're sort of going over all of this, do we need to be the ones to do it? Or do we just need pressure applied to the British, right? If British, because all you need, if you're the Americans, realistically, what you want is a situation where the British parliament and, 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 and George III's ministry are forced to choose. Do you want to expend blood and treasure to retain the 13 rebelling American colonies? Or do you want to expend blood and treasure to retain someplace like Jamaica or keep uh, insurance rates low for, for British mercantilist shipping houses? The Americans want to put the, the British in a position where they have to choose. And they come to realize they don't need to be the ones to do it. They just need that pressure applied. And it doesn't really matter how it gets applied so long as it occurs. This, of course, will be in part um, why the Americans will appeal to the French. French, uh, it's like an 18th century rule. Whatever the British do, the French have to be on the other side of it. And so, or whatever side the British are on, the French have to be on the other side of it. Um, and so, you know, the French are sort of an obvious ally for the Americans to reach out to. Uh, and that's the part that sort of gets brought up the most uh, in terms of this. But it's important to note that by 1782, when the British approached the Americans about coming to the peace negotiation uh, table, they are not just at war with the Americans and the French. The British government is at war with the Americans, the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch, open war with the other three major maritime powers. And individually, any one of those nations did not have the strength of the Royal Navy, but combined, all three of those do. And they don't even have to work together, right? As long as everyone's sort of ganging up on the British, that just causes enough problems for the British. The British need to find uh, ways out of existential threat. And the Americans who had you know, recently been British are, are sort of the obvious ones to ask to sort of call it quits so that the British can worry about more aggressive uh, threats. And so that becomes the interesting sort of strategic plan of the American Revolution is Washington's goal is not to lose in North America. Keep the American colonies in the fight by keeping an American army intact that can tie down British possessions and, and keep the attention of a significant portion of the British military. And, and it's important to note that, that in like 1776, 1777, half of the entire British army is tied down um, in North America. And about the other, uh, of, of the half that's left that's not in North America, half of that, right, 25% of, of the British army is tied down in Ireland uh, and tied down in places like Gibraltar at the mouth of the Mediterranean, hugely important strategic assets. And so the British are overstretched really kind of early on, what the Americans need is to just buy time, right? What Washington needs is to buy time for American diplomats to, to go stir up trouble uh, for the British, uh, against the British uh, in Europe. So Washington does not need to win battles. Washington just needs to not lose, right? And so clearly understanding what their vision was uh, allowed them to carefully select a plan that, that was realistic within the capabilities uh, that their organization uh, could achieve. Now, the, the thing is though, right, Washington's army was not just being asked by Congress to achieve military independence. It was to provide the time and space to set up some form of democratic republic. We can have all sorts of discussions uh, and we might, uh, during the question and answer portion about, you know, sort of how democratic that republic might be. Uh, it's certainly not going to achieve, you know, 21st century expectations for democracy, but it would still by just the very fact that it would not have an inherited um, aristocracy and nobility, uh, that it would not have a monarchy. It was going to be more democratic 
than than in, you know much of what had preceded it in in uh, about two almost two thousand years of uh, or seventeen hundred years of of world history. And so the interesting thing is that in addition to that that sort of military uh, aspect of what the Continental Army uh, is being asked to do, there's a whole civil military relationship. Uh, aspect to to what they're being asked to do and you might be familiar with uh the the image on the screen this is the part where normally i'd ask if anyone knows what it is but i'm gonna sit here a while if i wait for that uh and so i'll give you the answer in case you don't know um it is washington resigning his commission this was a painting commissioned by congress uh, in the 1820s it hangs in the rotunda of the capitol uh honestly if you've seen the news the past few months you might have seen it in the background with some stuff going on. Um, but what's interesting is that this is one of four paintings that Congress commissions in the 1840s to be in the rotunda, right? The, the, the temple of American democracy. Um, and Congress commissions these paintings that depict four moments that Congress in 1820s thought were sort of seminal moments in the creation of the American Republic. Uh, and they choose the moment uh, that Washington gives up his commission. Not the moment, interestingly, that this general, this successful general receives his commission, but the moment he hands it back to Congress, right? And, and Congress in the 1820s uh, and, and many a, a revolutionary leader uh, since then in both positive and negative aspects, um, I can explain more about that during question part if anybody has it, um, this was abnormal. This had not been done often uh, in world history, um, you know, the, these, these folks are for all, all recently British. Uh, about 100 years before the American Revolution breaks out uh, had been one of the English Civil Wars. Uh, this is the one where Charles I uh, loses his head. Um, England is declared a republic, uh, thanks in part to the actions of the army led, the parliamentary army led by Oliver Cromwell who will get you know, dissatisfied with parliament's ability to make decisions, uh, will oust parliament and declare himself protector of England, which is, you know, hey, if you've gotta be sort of an autocratic dictator type, like protector of whatever is kind of a cool name, but let's not go there, um, right? And this is also occurring in the 18th century, a time when uh, folks were, a lot of folks were, were really up on their classics and so when you, you, you sort of read the documents of the time period uh, that Washington is living through, and lots of classical allusions. So these folks were well aware of their Julius Caesars and their Catos and uh, their Brutuses, I guess it would be Brutus Psi, but you know what I mean, um, right? And, and so they're well aware of what had happened to the Roman Senate uh, with a victorious general uh, exercising a bit too enthusiastic of political power, trying to speak in the name of the people. A and so Washington consciously, you know, wants to break with this um, and do it in a big public way. There was nothing required. The army is basically disbanded, like the wartime army is basically disbanded at this point uh, or is disbanded at this point. Uh, in This all occurs, the painting is, is depicted something that occurred in December of 1783. Washington could have just mailed the commission, right? And the commission, he's not actually, you're not much of a general if you don't have an army, right? The army's gone. He could have just mailed this piece of paper back to Congress, but he didn't. And Washington, your fun fact for the day is Washington loved the theater. Thomas Jefferson loved reading him some novels. George Washington was a theater guy, uh, knew how to play a part. I mean, that was, he, he, uh, some folks don't like it when I describe Washington as a politician, but he was a great politician, uh, especially when it required him in sort of a performative role. And I don't mean that in, in sort of a negative or, or crass way. He understood how, how political theater could be important and useful and powerful. And so Washington uh, shows up to, to an assembly of Congress, publicly support, right, this is the, the big victorious general, you know, it's put in sort of modern political terms, you know, this is the guy with the highest favorability ratings in the country and is going to publicly subordinate himself in uniform 
to the civilian legislature. And, and that just took off, took, took all of, of uh, the wind out of the sails of anyone that was you know, sort of hoping for maybe some sort of American uh, version of a monarchy, even if it would be you know, sort of a, a Poland-esque elected monarchy, um, just took that right off, off the table. And of course, at this point, Washington does not know that the US Constitution is gonna be a thing. He doesn't know he's gonna be the first president of the United States. He thinks he's done. Um, but that, that sort of political act of subordinating himself to Congress uh, helped uh, sell the idea of, of, of what they were trying to achieve. And that's something that, that went not just through Washington as commander in chief of the army, but was something consciously practiced by the Continental Army throughout the war. It was part of their strategic execution. So, you know, Washington and, and his officers constantly working with everyone all the way down to the rank of private, understanding how their individual actions reflect the value system of the organization and are helping achieve their strategic end. And for the army, for, for military types like Washington, there was a concern uh, that, that we have this notion of, of the founding fathers and that they, they were this sort of monolithic group that were the founders and there's a sort of monolithic group that, that all thought the same and they didn't. They had wildly divergent opinions on, on what some sort of future American Republic might look like. Um, and a guy like Thomas Jefferson was not a fan of the idea of, of retaining an army and, and with sort of the idea of Oliver Cromwell and, and uh, Julius Caesar in mind of why that might be a bad thing. Why should the government, why should the people pay for this organization to exist at any given moment had the capability to wipe out uh, the government and rule by the people? Plus you need taxes if you're gonna have an army and Jefferson didn't like taxes. Washington's concern, uh, having seen the, the uh, let's just say lack of proficiency of the American militia system uh, was concerned that if there was no peacetime army uh, in any form, um, that the British would, yeah, okay, we might beat them now, but they'll just roll back in in 15, 20 years uh, and, and, and you know, take the American colonies on his back. Um, and so what Washington and the Continental Army really needed to be focused on uh, was really kind of establishing the political idea of a nonpartisan bureaucracy. Uh, that you could have a nonpartisan uh, government agency, right? In this case, the army that exists to serve the people. So in the same way that, you know, they're trying to get Congress comfortable with the idea of the army, uh, Washington, you know, working at places like Valley Forge to explain to his soldiers that I know you're hungry. I know you don't have clothes, but you going out committing individual acts of looting even helps undermine the civilian population's support for us, right? It's a question of hearts and minds. If, if the organization that the people, the, the people are paying for is hurting them, it's not surprising that the people won't trust that organization. And if we, Washington says, can't be trusted, right, the army, then the people will, the American people will not retain confidence in us, will disband the army for good. And, and all of the sacrifices we've been making are not gonna be worth anything because the British are just gonna come back or, or some other European power is gonna come back. And so, you know, really working with, you know, to put it in sort of uh, modern terms, you know, even frontline staff to understand how their individual actions in dealing with, right, how, how um, department, I'm not exactly sure how, how Wisconsin organizes things like their DMV programs, but in Virginia, they're sometimes administered a little bit through the county level. So I'm not sure if that's directly applicable to you all, right? But like how even just frontline government employees actions can can undermine uh, you know, the 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 voters' confidence in in their government. Um and, and so you know Washington is 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 explaining to his subordinates and 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 to the soldiers um how just their individual actions help inform uh the execution of their strategic goals. Um, now, I mentioned Washington was a politician and he was a good communicator. I think that was probably his most important uh, skill set as a politician. Um, because if you think about what the mission is he's undertaking, um, we're going to sacrifice a lot and it's going to take a good bit of time. And 
There's going to be a lot of moments where the army's not actually outgoing doing cool army things, but I super serious promise to you that all the taxes you're paying for this organization to like sit in a place like Valley Forge is itself a way to achieve victory. Um, and so Washington uh, sort of built into his strategic plan and into his communications to uh, governors, uh, state legislators, uh, his communication to individual American citizens, the idea of patience and that patience was a strategic asset um, that they needed to, to take part in. And we will have some time for uh, more on that if anybody has any questions. Now, of course, you do need to pay out every now and then, um, but because you sort of built in the capacity for patience um, was also sort of building, also helped build in some agility into their strategic plan. And so sort of understanding um, how to take opportunity as it pre presented itself. And so, you know, in some ways, the most famous example of this, uh, probably for a lot of folks is, um, if you're familiar at all with um, Trenton and Princeton, right? George Washington, certainly after uh, New York City has fallen, the American army is evacuating through uh, New Jersey, gets just outside of Philadelphia, um, almost Christmas Eve, uh, finds out that there's an isolated Hessian garrison uh, and, and Washington will uh, have his army turn around and sort of snap up uh, that Hessian garrison at Princeton. And that's kind of the most famous example of agility, but I wanna, I wanna dig into one other one. Um, one, because it's my personal favorite and it's my video and I can. Um, a lot of folks might be familiar that, you know, the, the Washington's most important military victory during the war uh, is is the successful uh, siege of Yorktown, Virginia. Um, now, normally I would ask groups, you know, what makes Yorktown, Virginia so important? Why were both sides fighting over it? And normally they stare at me like I'm an idiot because they realize that's the first, like one, why is this guy asking me some damn fool question? And two, huh, no one ever actually told me why Yorktown was important other than there was a battle there. Well, what were they fighting over? In part, nothing. Frankly, Yorktown, Virginia wasn't important to either side, um, which is why it was bad that the British had isol had left an isolated force there. Um, Yorktown, Virginia was not why the French and American troops uh, besieged Yorktown. Neither side cared about Yorktown. What the American and French troops want to do is capture those 8,000 British troops because they're in a place that was unimportant to the British. And they wanted to capture those British troops before the British commanders could bring those 8,000 British troops to someplace that was important to the British. British had screwed up. What they should have been doing was protecting a place like New York City, which was at that point the primary British base uh, and was the original plan for 1781. But as Washington and his French allies sort of look at you know, the defenses of New York, um, they come to realize it'd be a really risky proposition to attack New York directly. And why do that when there's 8,000 British troops just hanging out in Southern Virginia, uh, you know, not far from the beach where you could just kind of snap them up, right? British screwed up, let's take advantage of that. And so by building in patience to their plan, uh, it, it allowed for flexibility and uh, agility. Also, I think Washington, you know, I would sort of rate second after patience, Washington's most important sort of uh, leadership virtue throughout the war was allocation, right? And I've kind of teased on this already, sort of, you know, understanding sort of strategically how to allocate his resources. And that's one of the things that I think confuses uh, a lot of folks when they're under, when they're, when they're looking at Washington as a military leader is the confusion of just how many hats he's wearing, right? Because he is not only the commander in chief of the entire army, right? A position now that isn't even a uniformed military officer. He's the senior uniformed military officer, right? Because the commander in chief of the army is the president of the United States now. He's the senior uniformed member of the army and he's the major combatant force commander. So he's actually wearing like three different hats uh, at the same time. And, and, and what that meant was he had a lot of uh, resource issues uh, to tackle at any given moment. And as, as I think even is true to this day, uh, human resources can be some of the hardest uh, to deal with um, and, and sort of manage. And, and so to, on that note, um, you know, Washington uh, as, as a manager of people 
uh, in the sense of, you know, you look at the three uh, gentlemen depicted on the screen here, and these are three of the Continental Army's uh, senior leadership team by the end of the war, but none of them were in, were, were in positions of authority, substantial positions of authority uh, when the war uh, breaks out. Washington uh, identifies talent early on, cultivates the talent, and then is, is helping sort of manage it uh, and, and, and train it up as, as the war goes on. Now, of course, the war ends, and, and, and because I would argue they had an effective strategic plan, uh, but I mentioned that Washington, I thought, was particularly good at tying in his leadership style uh, and his management styles at any given moment uh, towards his strategic plan. And um, a lot of folks have maybe heard of Washington's farewell address, right? It, it's when he, it's essentially his exit interview for the presidency. What they don't know and gets sort of forgotten at times is that he essentially wrote the same document um, but for the American Revolution. It's called the Circular to the States. Uh, we have it available on our website. Uh, you can Google it and I think we're normally the top result because we're the only ones that care. Uh, you should care too though um, and tell your friends to care. But Washington wrote, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm, he thinks not going to be in a position of political authority anymore, but as someone that's been serving as commander in chief of the army and sort of a, a senior leadership position of this government for some time, here's some thoughts. Here's what maybe wasn't working with the, the Continental Congress and, and, and with the Articles of Confederation, which of course had been the governing documents prior to the Constitution. Um, and so, you know, Washington believed there needed to be a, 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 a more robust uh, proactive federal government um, that was able to be a little more enthusiastic and capable than what the Constitutional Convention, uh, or the um, more than what the um, Articles of Confederation had been able to achieve. And in part, he brings up, right, and again, thinking of something like the British or English Civil Wars in mind, Washington mentions, we just trained up like 500 to 700,000 young men to off what they considered illegitimate governments. If the Articles of Confederation and the Continental Congress cannot live up to the promises that it made to those young men, it's really not gonna be surprising if they decide that the current government isn't legitimate. Um, and so Washington had been uh, sort of on board with uh, some form of more robust government. Um, and of course, we'll end up being president of the Constitutional Convention, which will be the you know, a, a collegial body designed to craft some more robust form um, gov of government. But what's interesting is that even though he uh, 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 felt that it needed to be done as president of the convention, um, he sort of tailors uh, what, what had during the war been a very hands-on leadership style into something um, more passive, but I, I, I don't mean that in sort of a negative sense, um, in that he realizes now his goal isn't to go out and whip votes and lobby, that he has the, he realizes he has the favorability ratings to help sort of get this government trusted. He has the sort of national favorability ratings to help settle disputes in the convention, right? And so he, um, even though he's president of the convention, he rarely spoke on the record on any issues of policy. What he would do um, was facilitate the discussions about policy. And so like if there'd been a particularly cantankerous day uh, on the convention floor, um, Washington would invite uh, sort of representative people from either side of the issue over for dinner that night uh, for, for uh, what they thought was just gonna be dinner with you know me, cantankerous person on X side of an issue in Washington. And then I show up and I find out that, you know, why cantankerous person on the other side of the issue from me is also there at dinner. And Washington would sort of sit us both down and, and sort of say, okay, now you're not grandstanding in front of your friends anymore. Let's work out a deal, right? What are ways that we can, we can sort of find some sort of compromise or way forward on this? And so Washington sort of understood the power that his favorability ratings, if you will, um, gave him as sort of a neutral arbiter. Um, and, and so he intentionally didn't speak up much so that when he did speak, uh, it, it mattered that much more. 
if you will. And, and you know, one of the, sort of the most famous uh, examples of sort of public speech, if you will, there's a lot of things Washington's the first president to do, but one of the things he did not have to be the first president to do, and it was actually quite logistically challenging, um, was, was uh, visit every state in the union, um, right? I mean, this is the era of horse-drawn wagons and, you know, you do long distance communication by passing notes on horseback. So uh, logistically, it's kind of hard and, and frankly risky for the president to be uh, traipsing around the country in a wagon uh, away from the Capitol for, for months on end. Um, but Washington goes on these two presidential tours in part to help sell the idea of the constitution, right? Understanding that his main source of political power came from being seen as a trusted neutral figure. Um, and so using that to take the case for uh, the new government and take the case um, for the new constitution directly to the American people. You know, I get it. We had this, you know, we, we fought a whole war to not have a king. And now we've got this thing called the presidency and, and article two of the constitution is a little squiffy on exactly how much power that president has, but don't worry. I'm not a king. It's just me, George. You trusted me for eight years during the war. Trust me for a few more. Remember how much fun we had during the war? We laughed, we shot British people. It's gonna be like that. Less shooting of British people. Hopefully as much left. Um, and so Washington sort of, you know, understood how to sort of tailor that political message. Now, one of the interesting things is again, there's, you know, you know lack of um, a, a, a communication ability in the 18th century you know, compared to today. Um, he did not leave the vice president in charge because in Washington's administration uh, and, and deep cut this sort of original version of the constitution, vice president doesn't have any governing role. Um, and, and frankly, with the original version, the, the chances that the vice president would be from sort of the opposite end of the political spectrum were actually quite high. Um, Washington left his cabinet in charge, which if you know anything about Washington's cabinet, uh, especially if you've seen uh, or listened to the soundtrack of the play Hamilton, uh, is, is that frankly, th there were two members of the cabinet that, that did not agree with each other. And to say that would be sort of an understatement because Hamilton and Jefferson will develop the first two uh, political factions in American history, right? The, the, they're not quite at what we think of as political parties just yet, but they're on their way. Um, and so on the one hand, it could be kind of hard to, to leave you know, that cantankerous group in charge. And, and it is true that Washington had uh, this, this sort of wildly divergent uh, political spectrum uh, in his cabinet. I want to be clear, this is not some sort of Abraham Lincoln-esque team of rivals situation where Washington, Washington did not know from the start that Hamilton and Jefferson were gonna wildly disagree on issues of public policy. And neither did Jefferson and Hamilton, right? What had unified all of these guys was being not British. Now, once you're in that not British phase, what Washington's administration has to deal with and Washington, you know, as the head of the administration has to deal with, is there are 3.5 million different versions of being of what being not British anymore means. Um, and so, you know, it's just sort of by chance that Washington ends up with sort of the founders of the first two uh, opposition party or first two political parties in his cabinet. Um, and that was a difficult thing to manage, but Washington found ways to do it. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that some uh, during questions as well. I think he had some interesting sort of tactics that even are applicable today if you sort of update it, right? We're, we can get to, to how that might be, but um, you know, some ways to sort of diffuse conflict and, and help people sort of remind people uh, who it is they're working for. And by that, I mean, you know, in your case, uh, the people that vote for you. Uh, and so Hamilton and Jefferson needed to be reminded of that on occasion by Washington. I think he was quite effective at at doing that. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you so much. And I will see you shortly for questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we now have uh, Dr. Stoltz live. So please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask Dr. Stoltz any question or, or anything that enters your mind related to George Washington or the history of our country. Um, before we, I see people are starting to type in questions. 
Let me ask you a question, Dr. Stoltz, somewhat perhaps uh, unfair, but um, what lessons of leadership uh, provided by, by George Washington uh, need to be embraced today? And, and, and I guess conversely, which lessons of leadership are we really good at today that we are really holding true to? Hey, uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you all for, for continuing to, uh, to stick around for questions. Um, uh, I think, you know, one of the ones is I was just <laughs> having, having the weird thing of being able to rewatch yourself to a presentation and, and sort of taking notes about your own performance. Um, one of the things I, I actually made a note about was, um, and, and I'm not going to say that it's some, I, I don't know that this is something we're particularly good or bad at, at the moment, but I, I think a lot of people would benefit from, from sort of examining how good or bad they are at it, um, is really the importance of just even if it's to yourself, articulating an inst a desired in state for a project that is grounded in reality. Um, and, and I think, uh, and I got to be a little careful because Mount Vernon is a 501c3e. So we're a nonpartisan organization. And I'm, if anybody wants the real hot goss, email me in my uh, private email address. But, um, you know, I think, I think what, what, what I, from my perspective, what, I, what a lot of our, uh, groups that come in struggle with and just sort of what I see sort of feel like I see tangentially in, in, in the world at times is either either um, in state desired in states that are not realistic, at least in a near term scenario, um, or that some some groups just don't even have sort of clearly clearly articulated in states. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, some of this, um, and I mean this with all love in my heart, uh, 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 politicians like options, and I completely get uh, why, but I know with a lot of the military officers I, I, I worked with, that one of their big frustrations was that uh, they would feel like they were often sort of sent in to create options, rather than sent in with a clearly defined option in mind, if that makes sense. And, and you know, the frustration there, I think, can be letting um, tactics drive strategy. I think that's when it starts to become, uh, I, and I think it's, we, we either let the sort of day-to-day -day news, day-to-day -day events of the world sort of cast us about because we don't have maybe sort of a clearly articulated end goal in mind. And so it's easy to get distracted. Um, but you know, also conversely, um, you know, one of the things we, we've 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 had a lot of groups sort of uh, mention over the years is is well, everything happens so much faster now than in the 18th century. How do I update this sort of thinking to uh, to a 21st century sort of speed of decision making? And and I you know we sort of chatted out and and sort of investigated is that maybe a false dichotomy because if you have a, a clearly articulated in state that you've taken the time to sort of think thoughtfully about, and you've decided that is either your personal goal or your organizational goals. Then the real question is, as is each sort of event happens uh, within the news cycle or whatever, you just sort of ask, is this applicable? Is this something I have to actually worry about? Because is this something that either needs me to rearticulate or reevaluate my end goal or is this something that I can sort of shelve for now and and just well maybe not ignore just sort of put to the side as maybe not priority a um, and so that's that's my sort of long-winded answer to that if that makes sense it does we we have a comment and a question and uh, it, it goes like this great discussion since George Washington was a true servant of the people and the nation, placing others and the nation above all else, what would George Washington's take be on career politicians? Hunger for power, self-importance, a false claim to fame, complacency, stagnant ideas, losing touch with the people and the, and the issues, all these have been causing the major political issues in our nation. It would be interesting to know how our founding, founding fathers would address these. 
It's a great question. And it's one that I think we need to be a little careful about even the framing of how it's being asked. And what I mean by that is that um, I don't know that it would be entirely fair to say that George Washington was not a career politician. Uh, you know, he, he lobbies from a very early age to get himself a commission. He wants a commission in the British Army. He can't get it. He uses family political connections to get himself a position in uh, the colonial militia. As soon as the war is wrapped up, he actually spends 16 years as a state, the equivalent uh, of a state legislator in the Virginia House of Burgesses, right? He's going to give up that position to serve in the army for eight years. He'll ultimately spend, but um, the humanities major trying to do math live in my head, so bear with me, but like, you know, three or five years uh, before the presidency, and he'll only be, um, you know, out of the presidency for, for a year or two before he, he dies. So, uh, and, and, Similarly with guys like Jefferson, guys like Madison, um, it was, I think we want to be a little careful at times about um, differentiating uh, people that wielded political power in the past compared to ones today, because a lot of those guys would have absolutely been in office the whole time if you would have let them. Uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton would have loved to serve more than three years in the Continental Congress, but he was term limited. Uh, for three years. Jefferson would have been there uh, for longer if he could have, but he was term limited. Um, but, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the first portion of the question, though, is, is the real key, and, and that's that servant leadership part. And, and the thing I think is different, at, and look, guys like Jefferson, guys like Hamilton, at times guys like Washington could be complete hypocrites and, and completely sort of playing up the servant leadership thing while they were also exploring their personal interest. But there was the expectation publicly that you give a lot of window dressing, at least, to the, to the servant leadership part. Um, and I think that's maybe the distinction now is that um, we're almost, like the public is, is almost so jaded and cynical, it's not, a, it's not demanding even as much window dressing, much less reality. Does that make sense? It does, Doctor. Along those same lines of, of servant leadership, some people have uh, have indicated that the closest we have today to a George Washington uh, comes in the form of Colin Powell. How would you react to that? So uh, Secretary Powell is a good friend of Mount Vernon, so I have to react very carefully to that because he, <laughs> he hangs out here a lot. Um, yeah, and I mean, and I think and I think that's where, if I could, you know, just put my my scholar of of civil military relations hat on, um, almost gets a little scary for us, maybe as a, as a republic that it it seems to be. In general, we really have to keep looking for generals or admirals that that have sort of the clearly articulated idea of of servant leadership. It's it's certainly something that the U.S. military. Uh, promotes. I mean, you can't be a, a JROTC student at a Wisconsin high school without getting it drilled into you, uh, the importance of servant leadership. And, um, you know, I, I, I worry at times what it says about us as a republic, that it seems to only, it seems to be largely uh, most common in the military, but seems to be at times lacking um, as, as a leadership, desired leadership trait uh, in sort of the civilian world. Um, does that answer the question? I mean, it I, does. Yeah. yeah, very, very much so. Uh, here's another question. Uh, Dr. Stoltz, what do you think of the way George Washington was portrayed in the play Hamilton? Chris Jackson's also a friend of Mount Vernon. Um, but I, I, before I met him and learned on a personal level what a nice guy he is, I think Chris Jackson actually does one of the best depictions of George Washington um, that exists in American popular culture. You know, I mentioned in my video that uh, uh, a lot of the, a lot of movies and films, I, th I think sort of whiff on, on sort of capturing Washington, but um, I, I think Chris Jackson did a, a, did a great job of sort of showing a conflicted, but also um, a conflicted character that's also trying to be in control. Uh, another question, doctor. Uh, when Alexander Hamilton was Secretary of the Treasury, how much money was in the first Treasury, and how did they get it? 
the exact dollar amounts, I, I don't know. Um, not much. I know that's the, that's the short answer. Um, and how did they get it? Um, originally, uh, was through uh, uh, tariffs, through, through uh, tariff revenue, um, was largely the, the plan for funding the government was essentially uh, a combination of luxury taxes on international goods coming into the country, uh, or protective tariffs for um, industries that Hamilton and other sort of uh, proto-federalists had identified as you know, industries that it would be good for the, especially in, uh, startup industries. You know, the, the US had very little uh, industrial capacity because the idea was it was supposed to buy that stuff from Britain. Um, so the proto-federalists had sort of set up some uh, protective tariffs to, to help sort of uh, grow, do some, you know, startup inoculation. Uh, yeah, do some startup protection, basically. Um, and they will eventually move to uh, some excise taxes, which is where you get the Whiskey Rebellion and sort of the first big financial fight between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. In, in, in Jefferson's sort of ideal world, everything would be luxury taxes and taxes from, um, well, so where you, you be careful about who actually pays the taxes on a tariff, right? But in Jefferson's mind, oh, well, that's a tax on things being imported in. Hamilton's like, yeah, but that's still our people that are paying it, but whatever. Um, and, and so the big fight will be the excise tax, but it was originally uh, from imports. Dr. Stoltz, is, is our current modern day view of our founding fathers as selfless, deep thinkers that looked into the crystal balls centuries uh, into the future. Is that legitimate? No, no. Uh, you know, and I, and I don't want to, you know, sort of be too much of a Debbie Downer, but I mean, frankly, no. And I mean, you see in their own writings, uh, a, a self-reflection and concern of, are we actually doing this right? I mean, it, it's you know, one of the, of, of all the things that, there's a myriad of things they don't agree on, but one of the most common terms you see them consistently using is the idea of um, an American experiment. Basically like, we think this would work. Um, we think some form of representative government could actually function. And it's the only thing been keeping it down has been um, things like monarchies and hereditary aristocracy, but we don't really know. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're very much building the plane as they're flying it. Here is a question. You emphasized in your talk the importance of George Washington instilling confidence in the new government. How do we as government officials today cope with so many individuals, organizations, and media outlets whose main goal seems to be undermining confidence in and respect for our institutions? Yeah, and that's and that's what especially, uh, and I don't want to make sort of too much of this, but, but you know, um, Washington had an interesting press environment to work when, it, with as president. Um, so in the 18th century, there was no such thing as even an idealized goal of a nonpartisan press. A, a newspaper just was a federalist newspaper or a, a Democratic Republican newspaper. It just was. If I was the owner of that newspaper, it is absolutely going to be a, a vehicle for my views. And so Washington had to deal with uh, the first opposition press. And there was a, you know, a sort of famous, and, and, and Jefferson's friends were much better at this than, than the Federalist, um, which Washington wasn't a Federalist, but he was definitely Federalist leaning. Um, and there's a whole big dispute. And, and a newspaper had, had published a bunch of stuff that Washington was dissatisfied about the Washington administration. Uh, sort of alleging corruption in the Washington administration. And Washington uh, wrote the editor uh, a letter and said, basically, um, I want you to know that as George Washington, the person, you know, basically, I think you're a pile of crap. But as George Washington, the president of the United States, you know, I respect your right to publish BS. Um, and here's what we're going to do. Uh, you, you take your line to the people, I'll take my line and we'll see who they believe. And, and I think, you know, a lot of it is, it's, it's not, the, it's the completely unsexy work of um, going out and, and 
doing the hard work of being seen and being trusted, um, you know, uh, trying as much as possible to keep the activities of your, your organization above board, um, you know, building confidence in your actions and just, you, I think sometimes you can't overthink it. You've just got to go out and, and, and do the hard work and hope for the best. If that, that's probably not a very satisfying answer, but. <laughs> uh, doctor, you got a couple of questions. Um, could George Washington get elected president today? And then secondly, uh, if we believe that we hang out with like-minded individuals, who would who today would we see George Washington hanging out with at Old Ebbet Grill or the Capitol Grill? Yeah, I think, you know, could he win today? Probably not, um, in part because uh, he wouldn't run. And what I mean by that is, in part, the, the, in the 18th century, you did not campaign for office uh you or you 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 didn't run for office you stood for office you would literally stand there while someone talked about how awesome you were now you might have written a speech for them uh as, as your hype speech but um you know i think if if what you know in some ways maybe not dissimilarly from a colin powell type um i, I think washington would have left his let's take the military service as a given uh, in this particular uh, um, scenario, I, 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 I think um, he just wouldn't have run. I don't even, I don't even think there's an Eisenhower situation where um, the two parties can sort of compete for him to run under their banner by, by mutually pledging to sort of run to the center. Um, I, I think he just wouldn't have, have tried. Um, as far as who he would have hung out with, um, you know, that's sort of an interesting one because one of the, one of the in, in, in some ways weird, I think he would have spent a lot of time at like the Army Navy Club rather than Old Ebbet Grill. Um, because I'm sorry if that's a little too like Beltway uh, talk for it, but it, what I mean by that is that it, and it's something that I've, I've, I've actually been looking for it lately to see if other historians are bringing it up, but Washington actually did not get along but by, by, right, by the time he's actually an influential politician, he really didn't get along with other Virginians. Um, he really becomes not a Southerner uh, in, in terms of politics. Um, there just were not other Federalist, curious, um, you know, coming to question uh, the institution of slavery. There just weren't another, there weren't other Virginians and Marylanders uh, in his neighborhood uh, that they were into that. And, and, you know, his army service, I think has a lot to do with it. So that's why I say like, he probably would have just spent a lot of time at like the army Navy country club, um, where he would have been with other retired military officers. And I will have one final question, doctor. And I think fit, fitting, do you think there are a group of great leaders today, like Washington, Adams and Franklin of the past, but they are just spread across the business, academic government and military world and not as focused in a core group like our founding fathers? And can we get back to that focus for the benefit of our nation? I, I think, I think whoever asked that, a thousand bonus points, because I think they're on to something. And that's that, um, in my opinion, yeah, I, I, I think you nailed it with the idea that they're all spread out. And so in, in the 18th century, there is, and again, it's sort of a push-pull, right? On the one hand, they want to serve in government because it'll help their their business jobs. There's not it's not it's not kickbacks or anything like that nefarious, but there's there's much less. Um, and I don't want to even imply that necessarily there anything on towards, but the, the the blur between public and private service was there was a lot it was a lot blurrier back then. But what I mean by that is that, um, or why that's relevant to the question, is is that I think we don't have as much of a public service spirit as maybe existed in uh, the 18th and into the 19th century, where the idea of you want to encourage your best and your brightest to get into public service and, and basically like within their local communities, if they're not going to be at least temporarily serving like one term as a state Senator or one term as, as, as a, a you know, county official, even if that like, just the, the idea that if you have the skills you should and, um, 
I think that's gotten dispersed throughout uh, the society, and you know, it might help to get uh, you know a few more calls for for public service. I mean, I, I you know, we're, we're at, you all obviously serve in county government. I've done programs with a number of of counties uh, over the years, and I mean, just the I, I and I'm sort of the wonky uh, policy nerd type that I actually hopped on early for a lot of the legislative update because I like that sort of stuff. Um, and my God, the, the, the brain numbingly boring stuff that you all, and incredibly important, have to deal with um, that is just, it's not sexy and it's not anything you're ever gonna get tremendous reward out of. And thank God that you all do it. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people don't feel called to do and that's that's a bad thing so thank you for actually doing the the, the hard work of uh local governance we'll have we'll have one final question uh doctor and then uh, feel free to make any final comments you'd like does your instruction uh and experience tenure at west point give you hope for the future of our country i mean i love my cadets uh I was a grown ass man crying when, when my cadets actually beat Navy for the first time in years. Uh, and it was actually one of my, one of my students that, uh, that scored the winning touchdown uh, for that game. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think it, it sort of similarly to uh, one of the other answers I gave, you know, I, what I worry about is not the West Point cadets or, or I'll be nice here, the Naval Academy cadets or the Air Force Academy cadets, you know, the, they're all fine. It's, it's why do we keep looking, and this may not even be the way the question was asked, but or the intention behind it, but like, why do we keep looking for the military as a solution to um, you know, providing guidance for, for good civic education? Um, and I think, I think the very fact that we're asking these sort of questions is maybe uh, something we should be reflecting on as you know, something to work on, if that makes sense. We have been speaking with Dr. Joseph Stoltz of uh, the expert and uh, George Washington of today, I would say. Uh, I would strongly encourage all of our uh, participants in today's program, when you are in Washington, DC, make it a point to go visit Mount Vernon. Uh, it is an incredible experience and it's an immersive experience. And if you are lucky enough, you might be able to spend a little personal time with Dr. Joseph Stoltz. Dr. Stoltz, thank you so much for spending time with us today. You are truly one of our nation's treasures, and we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to, to be with us today. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, and, and thank you all for, for watching. I, I'm just a guy. <laughs> Tomorrow, we will have the second day of our, of our two-day event. Uh, I'd encourage you to tune in. It's an exciting day tomorrow. We will have a legislative roundtable chaired by our, our very capable Director of Government Affairs, Kyle Christensen, talking with the leadership of the legislature. We will uh, listen in on a conversation that I had with former Governor Tommy Thompson. We will also hear a legal update from our General Counsel, Andy Phillips of Von Briesen and Roper. We'll hear from Rebecca Blank, uh, uh, Chancellor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as uh, uh, from our the most capable and knowledgeable researcher in the state of Wisconsin, and I would argue the nation, Dale Knapp, who will talk about the COVID, post-COVID economy here in Wisconsin. That concludes our program for today. I encourage everyone to tune in again tomorrow at 8.30 when we will begin promptly. Thank you for joining.